Uh, welcome all. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Steve Bonta, who is a scholar. He's a two-time Fulbright scholar. He has a PhD in linguistics from Cornell. Uh, you see many people in uh, the Indescript, uh, you know, the problem, and they have, uh, you know, depth in certain areas. They have breadth. Stephen has both breadth and depth. He has worked on Indo-European. He has worked on Chinese. Uh, he, he has very deep work on uh, Dravidian and Tamil. Uh, he's worked in Sri Lanka. Uh, so it is very uh, heartening to have someone like Stephen Bonta work on this problem for decades. And uh, today we have the benefit of seeing all of it, all of his uh, work so far. He's going to try to present to us in as compact a time as possible. So uh, just to start with, Steve, how did you get into the Indus script problem? And uh, you know, you can take your um, presentation from there. Go ahead. Thank you, Yakna Devan. Uh, um, it's really an honor to be on your show. And um, yeah, so it, it, it was over 30 years ago, I guess right, right after I graduated, right after I got my undergraduate degree, I sort of had this idea that I would like to dedicate my life to solving an important unsolved problem. And it struck me that the decipherment of the Indus Valley script was such a problem. It seemed to be one that was, that squared well with my particular mm, skill set, my particular talents and interests. It was aligned with my, uh, certainly my enthusiasm for languages, which I discovered as a teenager. And so, of course, at that time, this was before the internet even existed, let alone, you know, all of the, the, the technology that we have today with databases and all the rest, which, as you'll see later on, I, I relied upon crucially in, in my work after they became available. So let's see, I, I guess I guess the best thing to do would be just to, uh, to launch into it. Um, I would just make a couple of prefatory remarks. And, and one of them is that, um, you know, that, that, that one needs to be very careful. Decipherment is... A very, a very odd bug. It, it is sort of equal parts science and art. In fact, uh, the late Gregory Posail, in a conference I attended once years ago, made the very comment that he said, "You know, we have to be careful and remember that decipherment is is an art." I'm not sure that that's entirely the case, but it does have an element of the aesthetic in it. In that, before you can do anything deductive, perhaps. You have to you you have to sort of look at what at, at at the at the data that you're dealing with, and I don't know how better, better to express it, but sort of look at it in a right-brained way and say, well, you know, what are some what are some of the likelihoods, what, uh, the the possibilities that are involved here, and ultimately be able to make judgment calls. Um, process that's been, been been called abduction, you know, sort of for, for forming hypotheses and random guesses and and checking them, thinking creatively and, and, and discarding possibilities that just seem to, that instinctively aren't working out and trying other things. So there is an element to that. But on the other hand, you know, I, I realized at the, at the beginning, before I could make, you know, any progress on decipherment that I needed to, to try at any rate to ascertain two important things. So thing one is, what is the nature of the writing system? Which is a bit, of a, a, bit, a bit of a complicated issue in itself. It goes far beyond, well, it's an alphabet or it's a syllabary or it's a logo syllabary or whatever. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. But that was the first critical thing that I felt needed to be ascertained before I could make any, any progress. And, and number two, you know, what is the nature of the inscriptions themselves? Meaning, what is the, what, what, is there any evidence from the inscriptions as well as from their you know their context as to the sort of information that they would likely convey so um let, so let's talk about one for a minute the nature of the writing system so let, let's say that ten thousand years from now you know a, a, a future decipher is confronted with a few fragmentary pieces of evidence of a language that was once called english okay but but due to some unforeseeable catastrophe or whatever complete you know collapse um, all knowledge of that language has been wiped out. So that person is in a similar circumstance to where the would-be decipher of the Indus Valley script is today. Namely, he has a certain body of evidence, uh, you know, in the form of writings, you know, fragmentary writings perhaps, but, but little more than that. So, you know, he probably would look at it 
and, and, and it wouldn't take him very long by doing a count of the different signs and, and analyzing the distribution to say, well, this is probably a pretty simple alphabetic type writing system. It clearly doesn't have enough different signs to be a hieroglyphic writing system. And so that, that sounds like a very neat solution until you realize that there's a lot more to English writing than the alphabet, okay? There are also quite a number of, well, there are punctuation marks, <clears throat> there are abbreviations, there are spaces that denote word breaks, and this is something that by no means one can take for granted. Many writing systems, probably the majority of them throughout the course of human history, have not used word breaks of any kind. Some have, and but other, many others don't, okay? So word breaks. Um, and then, of course, you have we, we do have logograms in English. There are not too many of them, but there's some, the ampersand, for example, the dollar sign, and uh, pretty much every mathematical sign. And, and again, what do we do with mathematics? If, if, the, if the future decipher happens to find an accounting ledger or a textbook on mathematics or mathematical physics or something like this that makes lots and lots of use of these extra alphabetic symbol systems, which are still part of English writing, but are not part of the alphabet, well, what, what, is he, what is he going to do? He's going to get some very odd results if he starts on the assumption that, well, everything I see is essentially part of the alphabet, part of the writing system, you know, sensu, uh, sensu stricto, right, rather than, you know, involving other things. Okay, so, so this, this, this is an issue. And as we're going to see, you know, this is, an, this is something that clearly is the case with the, with, the, with the Indus script, with the Indus writing system, that there's more going on there than just the representation of words as such. There are mixed in with that. There, there are symbols and, and, and other things like this that aren't necessarily denotative of words or word roots or, or, or case endings or affixes or what have you. Um, so, so part of the problem becomes how do we you know, tease out and determine which is which? So this is something that, that, uh, that, that, you know, that, that I want to look at. So let, let, me, let me try going through some of these slides here. Um, a little bit new to this. So the, the, the opening slide is nothing to say. And I, I'll probably pretty much gloze over the first few. Th these were more for a popular audience. I'm sure most people watching this are aware of the considerable extent of the Indus Valley civilization. The so-called mature phase is shown here in a map. Um, and I just want to quickly flip through a couple of pictures that should be familiar, of course, Mohenjo-Daro and so forth of, of, of Indus, uh, Indus sites. And um, the, the thing that I would just draw your attention to is the striking fact, long remarked by archaeologists, that this enormous and incredibly sophisticated civilization, in many ways the most advanced and certainly the largest in terms of geographic extension of its time period, is nevertheless conspicuously lacking in, in something that we see all over the Middle East and the you know, Mediterranean, other you know, civilizations of the same, the same Bronze Age period, which is almost no statuaries iconography, um, instances of writing on stelae and things of this sort. Rather, what we see is, and, and some of these may have been wiped out with the passage of millennia, we don't know, or they may have used wood or other perishables to construct their statuaries if such, such existed. But to this day, for example, we have not identified for certain a religious structure, a temple, despite the fact that the iconography on the seals, which we'll be talking about in a minute, you know, does certainly suggest that there was a robust, you know, religious tradition establishment and, you know, but aside from a few tantalizing hints like the so-called priest king uh, bust, uh, you know, we, we really don't know much at all about the culture as such in the usual sense of the word. When people think of culture and they think of their, you know, their world cultures class from junior high, they think of temples and priests and uh, elaborate pantheons and mythologies and all of this. And, and we don't see any, any evidence of this. Uh, except on the seals themselves, but certainly not in the building. So this is a very curious fact. All right, um, let me just jump ahead. So this, these are the stars of the show. These are just a few examples. And for, you know, going forward, because I don't have you know copyright to most of these images, these are a few that I was able to find online that seem to be copyright free. But the majority of the images are held in copyright, so I can't just show them uh, willy nilly. Uh, this is these are four typical examples of so-called seals. On the back, they typically have a raised boss with a hole through it, so clearly designed to be... Hey, Steve, uh, I don't think the slides are moving. The slides are not moving. I, I, I only see the, the opening slide, the partial decision. Right. Well, let me, let, me try, let me try the slideshow. How about that? Nothing yet. Okay. Well, this poses a problem. 
I just oh, I, I can I can move so you can move it here. Um, so there's a little thing at the bottom. You can press uh, arrows. So if you see the slideshow, um, oh. you see oh, next. Wait, what, if I do th what if I do this? Okay, it moves now. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, I, I apologize. So once again. So those are some images quickly of the aforementioned Harappan civilization. Indus Valley civilization uh, has various names. Okay, this is the slide I was talking about. So here, here are a couple of images of the um, of a couple of typical, fairly canonical seals. The one in the upper left, this one up here, is the famous uh, Lord of the Beasts seal, as it's called, or Pashupati seal, which of course uses the, the, the Sanskrit word meaning Lord of the Beasts, which is an epithet affixed to Shiva. It's sometimes also called the Proto-Shiva seal. There's at least one other authenticated seal that looks similar to this. And, and so you can see there's, a, there's an inscription across the top and some wild beasts and a couple of human figures and this kind of thing. It's a very interesting seal. Doubtless most of our viewers will be familiar with it. And then over here we have what's called the unicorn bull motif, which is unicorn because it appears to be in profile, but anyway, only one horn is visible. And uh, it has an inscription across the top, usually just one line. And again, on the back, there's that raised boss. You can't see that here. Um, and then some other seals with less commonly featured animals, a zebu and an elephant, and there, there are others. So what I've done, what I will do henceforth, and uh, you know, warning to our viewers, this will be a little bit lengthy and involved, but from now on, the inscriptions that I show uh, will be um, will be basically just printed. You won't you won't see the seal or context, but where where important, I will list that context. And certainly in my, my the work that I published that I put online, uh, it, I tried very hard to make sure that every inscription given was also that the context was given as well, the type of the object. And 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 there are a quite a few you know pot sherds with scrawlings on them and a few implement heads and this kind. There's even one small signboard that was unearthed at, at the Dolavira site about 30 years ago. Uh, but the preponderance of Indus seals are in the form of seals themselves like these, and then these smaller uh, token-like uh, devices, uh, and then um, also some sealings, meaning uh, in impressions in, in, in clay tags that have since been, that have, that have been preserved and come down to us, okay? So that's what we have. Note that we don't have any long inscriptions, and, and, and this, this is, is one of the major, well, there are several major problems with decipherment of the script. Let me just go over them very quickly. One is the brevity of the inscriptions. So we have several thousand, quite a few thousand of these inscriptions. Um, there are many repeat inscriptions, and they're very brief. The longest inscriptions, well, tw 20 some characters, okay? But we don't have any codices, we don't have any inscribed stelae, we don't have any papyri, we don't have any documents of any length. Indeed, we don't have any clear evidence to show whether or not this script had in fact a literary usage, and it's entirely possible that it did not. Um, nowadays, most people who, who, who you know, paleopigraphers have concluded that contrary to what people used to believe about writing, namely that writing originated as a, as a heretic device for, for, for sacred use in temples and so forth, nowadays the evidence suggests that writing in fact originated for mercantile purposes and in some instances was later expanded, cuneiform being a good example of this, uh, it, 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 you know, expanded and developed into a, a full-fledged full literary instrument. Okay, so it's not clear whether in fact the, what we're seeing here is some sort of a condensed version of a much larger script and literary tradition, or whether in fact this civilization, as was the case with proto-historic India, apparently prior to Ashoka, uh, had no writing system and yet created this vast body of oral literature perhaps feeling that language was too sacred a thing to be written down, uh, particularly language about sacred things, you know, like the Puranic literature and so forth and so on. I don't know, but it's certainly a possibility. And then another problem is that we have no bilinguals. We don't have a Rosetta Stone. We don't know any place names or, or king names or any of these other usual devices that have been used as for what I, what I call entering wedges by clever uh, epigraphers over the last several centuries, working on Egyptian hieroglyphs, working on the various forms of cuneiform, more recently working on uh, linear linear B and uh, hieroglyphic Hittite and all, all these other more modern scripts, the Mayan script, of course. Um, each of these has had some sort of uh, entering wedge, and it's been different in every case because no two scripts are the same in terms of their their nature and the circumstances are widely divergent. Okay, so 
we have to sort of make use of the, the, the evidence that we have in hand and try to find some way in. All right, so here's the first point that I want to make. Um, and this one I'm going to make fairly forceful. There are, in, in my view, there are two distinct types of writing, which I've already alluded to, and they being transcriptive and notational. So transcriptive writing is writing as we usually think of writing to be. So it's writing that tries to represent more or less fully and sequentially some standardized phonetic version of words as they actually appear in speech. So this could be alphabetic writing. It could be hieroglyphic writing. It could be syllabic, logosyllabic. It could be abugida, as, as is the case with most of the, uh, the, the, the modern scripts in South Asia. But all of these, these writing systems, in as much as what they're trying to represent are the words that people actually utter, whether in a formal speech or in informal conversation, constitutes transcriptive writing. But all fully fledged writing systems also have embedded within them another important element, which I call notational. And this is writing that represents words partially and often non sequentially, sometimes without regard to phonetic accuracy. So these would include things like abbreviations, uh, conventionalized symbols. I mentioned mathematical symbols early on. Uh, types of writing that often embody notational writing include calendrics, uh, accountancy, mathematics, and so forth. So I'm going to argue that both of these types of writing are found in at least, well, many of the Indus inscriptions, not all of them, okay? And that the fundamental problem to establishing a baseline for decipherment is dis discerning which is which, to be able to tease out the one from the other. Okay, so here's a, a couple of examples. So transcriptive, um, five pounds, three ounces, all spelled out, but most of us don't write it that way. We would write the numeral five, then the abbreviation LB period, and, and so forth and so on. So you can see some other examples here. Um, mo money, obviously, is another transcriptive context. Um, no one would think to write the number pi and spell out each of the each of the numerals literally, but you could do that, right? They obviously, written English allows you to do that, but we would normally write 3.14, etc., using the numerals, okay? And likewise for the other the other symbols, there's a date and of course e to the power of x or e to the x, as they always say in the calculus classes, but we generally don't write it out that way. Okay, so um, and as you can see here, you know. We often mix them together. So here's an example. Look at the first one in particular. Uh, the M. Vahia referred to as a, as a colleague of mine in India, by the way. But you can see the, bl the blue is notational. So there's a date and then there's an abbreviation for the word received. And then M, the first name, is, ab is abbreviated also. And then rupees 8,000, that's also a, uh, you know abbreviation. Four ounces, an abbreviation. But the rest, from, and then his last name is spelled out full, and the word for, and silver tokens. And likewise with the little mathematic, ma mathematical expression below. It's a mixture, right? So failing to take account of the, the, this distinction by a would-be decipher can be fatal if it turns out that your source material contains both of these types of writing. All right. So let's just uh, quickly talk about some things that don't work with decipherment, and but which have nonetheless been tried over and over again, I think in, in, the, in the vain hope that this time it'll work. So uh, number one is trying to identify the graphology of the sign and simply assigning it the meaning of whatever the sign looks like without doing any other work beforehand. Just looking and say, okay, you know, and then just putting together all the signs. Okay, so I, I, I do demonstrate, if I had more time to do demonstration, you could do this with English. So if you look at the letter S, you say, well, that looks like a snake. So that must mean snake. Okay, well, the problem with that is, of course, that utterly disregards the type of writing system you're working with you know, and, and you could look at the other letters of the English alphabet and come up with some sort of spurious, because all letters look like something, all characters look like something. And indeed, some of them are designed to look like something. This is not to say that some characters aren't pictographic in origin and perhaps in substance, but you can't start from that point of departure, okay? You're just going to, you're going to yield gibberish. And then number two is, is similar to this, it's a little more advanced, but having already decided what the target language must be, trying to identify the graphology of the sign and assigning it the sound of whatever the sign is assumed to represent in the target language. This is the wrong way to exploit what, what epigraphers call the rebus principle. The rebus, of course, is using a picture that sounds like a word. For example, if I were to write English, instead of using the letter I for the first person singular pronoun, to draw a picture of a human eye because the two words sound alike, that would be a rebus. Okay, and the rebus principle is found in most, if not all, writing systems if you dig deeply enough. For example, the fact that the S and its predecessor, the Greek sigma, look like a snake, which makes an S type sound, 
is probably not coincidental if you go back to the origins of the writing system. But that doesn't mean it's going to aid us particularly in figuring out what that sign stands for now. Because most writing, a lot of writing anyway, is symbolic. And symbolism is something more or less arbitrary. The association of a symbol and its object that it represents is an arbitrary thing. Okay, so here's what may work. And emphasis on may because this is a very inexact science. And frankly, there are no guarantees. Okay, so uh, ascertaining the nature of the writing system, which I've mentioned already, the next one is critical, ascertaining whatever can be learned about the typology of the underlying language. What I mean by this is the sorts of things that the language does. Now, linguists who study language typology like to look at things like canonical word order. Is the language typically SVO, as is the case with English, meaning it puts typically the subject, then the verb, then the direct object in that order? Or is it SOV, like Dravidian? and many other languages from that part of the world, uh, subject, object, verb. Languages tend to have, although not universally so, but tend to have a canonical word order, a relationship between subject, object, and verb. And, um, and so that's an important clue, can be an important clue. And there are many other things as well. If they're, you know, what do the adjectives do? With, or do, do are they placed before or after the noun? Does the language use prepositions or postpositions? Or in the case of German, both, although, you know, so, 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 so languages, so the, the, these are all interesting typological questions that famous linguists like, like Greenberg labored to understand and point out, you know, that you can learn a lot about a language if you can establish that. Now, obviously, in an unknown script with unknown writing system, answering a question like this is daunting, but it is an important thing. Then, of course, becoming completely familiar with the signs and their patterns of distribution. Here's something that I did at the very outset of my work more than three decades ago. Uh, when I still had, you know, really brown hair and wasn't feeling my age, I decided that I had to become intimately familiar with the entire script. So I went to the university library and I photocopied the first part of the Mahadevan con concordance, which was the major concordance available at that time. Um, only the part that listed just gave a list of all the inscriptions, nothing else. Okay. And then I went through that list by hand and it took me about a year and a half to do this, and I and I made my own handwritten um, concordance for all of the major signs, going over and over and over the list. Again, this is long before searchable databases existed, and so I did it by hand. And the virtue in that was that I became just completely familiar with the signs and their patterns of distribution. Early on, I picked up on some interesting patterns that I'll be talking about in a minute. Um, but but the point is that there's no high road or royal road to a decipherment. It requires a lot of work. I also, when I knew I was going to be serious about this, I spent years and years studying the relevant languages and even doing field work in India and, and, and Sri Lanka, as was mentioned in the introduction. So, you know, I spent years and years learning Sanskrit, learning Pali, learning Avestan, learning Tamil, learning some Telugu, some Malayalam, um, you know, learning what I could about the, about the literature and the culture and anything that I could learn that might, you know, buttress my ability to have critical insights into the writing system, I learned. And this was a labor of many, many years, most of which was carried out in my own time, except when I was at Cornell, I did take courses in some of these languages and, uh, and, and, and uh, also did some study abroad in South India to learn Tamil. But an awful lot of it, it was a labor of love on my own part. I didn't get any funding for it. And it just, I, it just involves a lot of time, not 10,000 hours, but many times 10,000 hours. So, so that's that becoming familiar is is, is critical. Uh, next, uh, let's see, exploiting the rebus principle instances where both the distribution and the graphology of the sign happen to suggest a particular value. I'll let that speak for itself as we go forward in the presentation. Making use of any contextual clues, which my archaeologist friends like to emphasize. This is of course important. You know what, and where are these where are these writings found? Well, we've already explained that, okay? But uh, but these are significant, okay? And finally, perhaps most importantly, and I can't emphasize this enough, trial and a lot of error. Laboriously trying values for signs with sufficient available distributional, contextual, and or graphological data. And this is a process of years, even with the help of uh, searchable databases, which I'll explain later on. It took a long, long time and many, many, in hindsight, embarrassing errors and false leads and uh, you know, and this kind of thing to do it. 
There's just no other way to do this kind of work. And for this very reason, I think decipherment is, you know, you have to be a little bit eccentric to be interested in this kind of work because it, it's not the type of research that lends itself to neat um, uh, solutions, easy demonstrations. It's not the sort of thing that can be summed up in a 4,000 word paper that will convince anyone. Uh, so it's very difficult to get this kind of work published in, in most science journals and so forth of any repute. Uh, tend to have a 4,000 or at most a 6,000 word limit. And, and, you know, and, and you have to amass, I mean, you know, in keeping with what Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary claims re require extraordinary evidence. In this case, a lot of corroborating evidence. So anyway, and that evidence is only distilled thanks to a lot of work. All right. So ascertaining the nature of the writing system, I mean, that's pretty much agreed upon. Uh, if you count the number of signs, um, you know, of, of, the, of the Indus Valley script, I mean, it's in the hundreds, it's certainly not in the thousands. So that makes it, it can't be a simple syllabary like, like linear B, much less an alphabet or a boogita type script. Um, it has to be a little more complex than that. Nevertheless, it's not, nowhere near, at least from the available evidence, nowhere near the complexity of say Chinese uh, or hieroglyphic, Egyptian hieroglyphic, which whose signs number in the many thousands. That's, that's a purely hier hieroglyphic script. So, you know, so we have a pretty good idea about that. Um, but more than that, you know, ascertaining the nature of the writing system means determining which signs likely correspond to simple syllables. CV syllable, perhaps VC syllable, uh, V syllable, by C I mean consonant and V I mean vowel, right? So typically syllable signs will be CV in form. Many, many writing systems have this, this thing. Uh, which signs likely co you know, are, you know, correspond to logograms or full words or word roots or something like this. And it also means, re referring to what I mentioned earlier, it means ascertaining which sign sequences are likely to be transcriptive and which notational. Okay, so that's, these are all critical in ascertaining exactly the kind of beast that we're trying to tame here. Okay, so let's look at our first example. Now here are a bunch of inscriptions and what I will typically do is to the right of the inscription, I will show um, an, you know, an, an, a catalog number for those interested in following up, of course, this is going to be available online, so you can rewatch parts of it if you're that interested. And uh, you can all you can also find these tables or reasonable simulacra thereof in my my published paper online. So this is intended as a guide to understanding the paper. Um, but here's a recurrent pattern that I recognized very very early. Okay, and this is what I call the M field for reasons that will become apparent. Now the M field in each case here is underlined uh, with, with with a red bar. And to the right, again, the, the MH stands for Mahadevan. So these happen to be the, the index numbers from the Mahadevan concordance. There are other sources that I've used that I'll refer to later on. But we'll use that for now for convenience. And the M field is a very particular group of signs, a subfield within a large body of the Harappan corpus. Not all inscriptions have this field, but uh, the majority of them do. Okay, and it consists typically of a cluster, an, an individual or cluster of signs that all seem to be formed on a fish-like grapheme as its sort of base motif, and then sometimes accompanied by one or more signs with this oval shape. Here's here's a couple of these oval signs, um, and then occasionally other another another sign pair, which is going to become very significant later. This pair here, which is uh, oh, and I should mention before we go any further, the direction of writing. I forgot to mention that this is very important. One of the few agreed upon things for decades is that the canonical direction of writing is right to left. So in a, like this inscription here, this would be the quote unquote first sign in the inscription. And this one over here, it looks like an elaborate U or a vase is the last sign. Okay. Now, when you look at the actual pictures of seals, it's the reverse because of course the seals are designed to be read after they've been stamped in something and have left their mark. Okay, so the, but this is the canonical writing system right, direction right to left. Okay, so these M clusters or M fields, as you can see, um, consist of consist of can consist of as few as as two or even one sign. Sometimes they're found by themselves, more or less, with nothing nothing much after them. Um, and uh, some other times they're found. So here, for example, if you compare MH three three one two O with this this inscription here with this one here, which by the way is the etc means it occurs a number of times. It's a repeated inscription. We find this as a sole, as a, as a, as a sole, you know, autonomous inscription on many in many sources. I think at least like fifteen or something like that. Okay, so that tells you that this sequence here is either a word or sequence of words unto itself. And when we have another sequence like this, where we have essentially the same thing but a couple of little fishy-like signs uh, right adjacent to it. That this is um, 
a different thing, a different field, so to speak. And you can see that same pattern up here. Again, we have these same four signs, but then right adjacent to them, we have this field. And then we have this other thing, which we'll talk about later on. So this is called seg segmentation. And this is something that I did very early on was to try to get a sense for the segmentation of the text. Here's another very common, uh, you know, lone uh, inscription. You can see it's on many different sources. All right. Um, but here it is found in context, again, with this sort of M field uh, mixture of some fish signs and oval signs. And you hear it, here it is again with something, uh, something else similar. So this is a pattern that you see replicated hundreds and hundreds of times. And my earliest reason was this has to be significant. And if there's any kind of entering wedge to be had, then it's probably going to be found in, in, in these, these weird, you know, highly patterned subfields, the M fields, and wrapped up in what they, what they mean. Okay. So um, anyway, so here's the canonical structure of the M field. And this is important. This, this, by the way, this dates to work that I did back in the, all the way back in the mid nineties. I actually did my master's thesis uh, at BYU on this, on this topic. And at the time it was well received by some people in the field. And you, you can see, so, so, so the M field typically consists of three uh, elements, although not all of them are necessarily present, but when it's fully fledged, you'll have three elements. You'll have first, uh, rightmost, one or at most two signs that seem to be based on an oval motif. Okay, so here's a couple examples of those here and here and here. Here's a single example. Then the next to the left will be one or more up to three signs based on the fish motif. This pair, by the way, here is actually a single sign. It's written as two discrete graphemes, but they're actually uh, paired sign. So that that's like the middle element in the M field. And the leftmost element is this invariant pair. The first one looks like a little, a little U with a stick thing stuck down into it. And then these three strokes, okay, occur over and over again, right? So not all of, not necessarily do all three of these elements co-occur in every M field, but when they do co-occur, they co-occur in that, almost invariably in that order. There are like one or two exceptions out of many, many hundreds of examples, okay? And I listed here the totality, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven uh, in all of these so-called fish signs. There are other signs in the Harappan signary that also look like fish, but that are not involved in these M fields. So we're going to disregard them for now, okay? They're, they're not important. And then these three um, oval signs, this one is, is often represented as two different signs. Uh, the little thing in the middle sometimes looks a little more square. So Mahadevan and the, and the uh, ICIT list them as separate signs, but it's clear to me that they're the same sign. They're, they're, they're allographs, meaning uh, graphological variants. So this is the canonical structure of the M field. I'm gonna keep moving. This is a fairly long presentation. So in the interest of time, uh, you can review all of this at your leisure, okay? So I concluded early on that M fields must be some sort of notational abbreviator conventional writing for the simple reason that, and if we just go back here and look at this, this weird recurrent pattern over and over again, this is not what you would expect if these represent, let's see if these are actually spelling out words or something like that. What it looks like is some sort of conventionalized notation. Um, one of the first people to investigate the script, uh, Hunter, way back in the late 20s, I think, did a very nice little job summarizing what was then known, but he looked at these and he said, well, okay, you know, he, he knew some South Asian languages. Well, obviously, you know, like the basic fish sign probably represents a syllable like pa, and then this one is p, and this is pu, and this is po, and so forth, which is how an Abugida script works, okay, like the Devanagari script, or the Tamil script, or the Telugu script, and or so forth, and so forth, okay. Um, of course, that doesn't make any sense because, okay, then why would all of the, you know, pa, pi, pu, and so forth, why would they all be together like this? You know, and then presumably the oval scripts would represent another variation of the theme, and then they're all always together. So this 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 doesn't look at all like any kind of natural writing, or or I should say, writing that represents natural language. It's clearly something else. All right. And so here's some possibilities, some of which I've mentioned already. Um, maybe standardized titles. I, I know that at one time, um, I believe Parpola interpreted the fish signs as as related to some sort of titles or honorifics. Uh, calendrics, addresses, meaning um, like street addresses or something like this, uh, notations of assets or transactions, uh, and numerals of some sort. So, I mean, I guess we can just sort of see which ones are ruled out. And let's start by looking at the meaning of the, the basic fish sign. So the fish grapheme appears as a sign unto itself. And it's the only one of these so-called, se of these seven fish signs that occurs outside of M fields. Okay. It has other meanings. And so it seems reasonable 
to suppose that whatever the meaning of these seven clearly related signs are, and they're related because of their, not just because of their graphology, but because they're always juxtaposed when they co-occur, all right? Um, so it, it argues that there's a shared meaning element, and the most logical thing would be to say, well, obviously the fish sign per se is denotative of whatever that shared meaning element is, okay? So here's a, an interesting fact about that fish, this fish graphene. It also occurs very frequently in association with what are obviously stroke numerals. And there you can see just a few examples, but there, there are many more. So the fish sign, whatever it is, has some relationship to numerals, okay? Which shouldn't be surprising since, you know, most, of, most, although not all of our examples of notational writing have some numerical element, you know, addresses, calendrics, uh, weights and measures, this kind of thing, okay? The question is, which, it, wh which is it going to be, okay? <clears throat> well, I've concluded, and I concluded, this is something that I concluded way back in my master's thesis in the mid-90s, that these are most likely metrological and represent notations of assets or transactions, okay? Meaning they probably represent weights and measures because that was pretty much how, you know, this is long before money as we know it today had been invented. So typically weights and measures um, were what substituted for money were the way that you marked assets, you know, a certain amount of, of uh, you know, grains of gold or silver or copper or, or ivory or whatever, okay? But, but, but something like that was in terms of weight, okay? Now I should add before I go on to the other possibilities, when I pre presented this um, many years ago at a conference in Harvard, the immediate question was, well, come on, these are seals. Why would they have that on seals? Okay, well, that's a, a good question. And we're going to defer that till close to the end of the, of, of, the, of the, that was a question that I asked myself too, because other seals from other cultures typically have votive formulae, have names, um, things of this nature, but not, but not necessarily, you know, weights and measures. Why would they be found in this context? Okay, I'm, I, I wasn't sure then. I only knew that it was the only possibility that made sense. Well, and why? Well, because calendrics, there's not enough light regularity. So if you had, if they were calendrics, you know, you would presumably have a standardized way of, of, of denoting the month or whatever the equivalent was in their system and the year uh, and the day or something that's pretty much universal. Um, but you don't find that on the, on these seals. Uh, you find many, many, many different permutations uh, that don't necessarily always use the same, as I mentioned, they don't always use the same elements. They don't always occur. Sometimes you only have fish signs. Sometimes you only have the oval sign. Sometimes you only have a little U thing with the, with the, uh, with the three, uh, the three slashes after it. Okay. So it, it, it doesn't make sense that that would be uh, calendrics. Addresses. I mean, your problem there is you, there are no candidates for toponyms or individuated locales in so-called addresses. Um, and also you find similar patterns on artifacts from many different sites from thousands of miles apart, which argue for something far more standardized than addresses are going to be. Because obviously, you know, my address living in a small city is going to look quite different from the address of someone living in Manhattan or different from someone living in a rural location or someone living in a village or something like that. Um, so it, it just didn't, it, it doesn't, without going into further detail in the interest of time, you know, it, it, that didn't make sense. Titles. I, this can be dismissed pretty much out of hand. There are far, far too many permutations within these M fields for what a relatively restricted set of terms would be assumed to have. Preview of coming attractions, there are titles in the inscriptions. We're going to see some of them, but they aren't found in the M fields. And finally, numerals. Well, okay, but the thing is we already have lots of numerals in the form of these stroke numerals and probably also some of the little curved lines. I'm not going to get into them today, but there, are, there, there already are other signs that clearly act as numerals. And it's also clear that the M, at least the fish signs, do, are related to numerals, but aren't necessarily the same thing. So they, uh, they, they can't be pure numerals. So just by the process of elimination, you know, metrological is the only thing that makes sense given the distributional data and the evidence available. Okay. So the working hypothesis that I came up with was that the O subfield and the F subfield represent uh, two separate met metrological series. And interestingly, this is borne out um, by the actual weights that have been created, that have been discovered from the Indus Valley, particularly for the, first, for, for the, for the fish series. There happen to be seven signs, and those signs never you know, co-occur like if you have, a, a, they occur in groups of up to three typically in an M field, and they'll never be rep repeated in M field. So, so that's an interesting fact. There is a certain order that they tend to occur. It's not absolutely ironclad, but but I'm not going to go into that right now. That's in my master's thesis and other things I put online if you, people are interested in this. 
But here's the point. The point is that the, you know, the excavations of Makai and the other people that, that first dug up the, the, the civilization, you know, Harappa and Mohenjo-Dar back in the 1920s, aside from seals, excavated lots and lots and lots of weights. And among those, they, they found a series of seven weights, which in unit terms would be unit one, and then two, and then four, and then eight, then 16, then 32, then 64. Okay, so each weight is double the previous weight. The point of that, by the way, of having weights configured in that way, is that it behaves like a base two no, no, numeral system. You can, it, it allows for maximal economy in record keeping. You don't have to list anything more than once. And if you work on that in your head, you'll see why that that's the case. So, so that that so my hypothesis was, and I and I maintain that to this day, that those seven weights, whatever their names may have been, and we don't know, probably correspond to these seven fish signs. And then the other, the three oval signs probably correspond to maybe a higher series of weights. And again, I don't want to get into that, but, but that's the idea. And then finally, and perhaps most intriguingly, this invariant pair with the, the little U sign followed by the three strokes, I assume meant something like the amount of or exactly. Okay, that seemed to make sense. It didn't really behave like the other signs, but it was often there. Um, and so anyway, so I thought that th these were all interesting facts. And um, in addition, I'd like to, to acquaint you briefly with what I and others before me have called the staff sign, because it looks like a little bit like a staff of grain or a, a blade of grass or, or, or something like that. And I hold these two as allographs. Their distribution is exactly the same, although they're listed as separate signs in Mahadevan and also in the ICIT. Um, they're, they're, they're clearly, to my view, allographs, all right? Um, Fair Service, way back in 1992, regarded this sign as a likely dry measure. So I'm not the first person to think that there might be, you know, indications of measurement on these on on these in these inscriptions. Okay, um, and I, I I think that this one is also a unit of measurement. It's different from completely different from the others that we've mentioned already, but it occurs very frequently, as you can see, uh, left adjacent to various stroke numerals. And notice that most of these here are actually from full-fledged seals. They aren't from little, you know, potsherds. Some of them are, but not from potsherds. They occur on seals, you know, seals with unicorn bulls and animal field figures. So looking at this, I don't know how anyone can look at this and say, oh, well, that must be a votive formula or that must be a king name or something like that, especially since the number of strokes varies from one, from one context to another. Okay, so we're clearly seeing full-fledged seals complete with a, with, a, with a field figure, an animal field figure, whatever, um, with these types of inscriptions on them, which again, I think argue very eloquently for the, for, for, the, for the possibility, for the likelihood that there is some sort of a numerical and metrological component to many of these inscriptions, however much that may militate against uh, preconceived notions or received wisdom in, uh, among archeologists. Okay, and here's yet another example. This, this, this little U sign plus, plus stroke numerals uh, occurs particularly on uh, on tablets, occasionally on the side of seals, um, and also, and and this is also assumed to be re represent a measurement of something, because it kind of looks like a little bowl or pot with a varying number of strokes next to it. Occasionally accompanied by our friend the fish grapheme, so there's another piece of evidence for its use, and also this bowman sign of which we will have much more to say later on. It looks like a dude holding a bow. Okay, and here are a few examples of that. You can see. So line two typically means it occurs on the other side of the object in question. And most of these inscriptions are coming from non, uh, from, field, from, from small seals without field figures or little chit-like items, um, sometimes called tablets. So there you go. And you can see in some cases, in addition to the strokes and the bowl, you have a bowman sign or a fish sign. Okay, I have a question and I'll answer it right on. Oh, we'll get to that. Don't worry. Okay. All right. All right. Spoiler alert. And there, and probably the reason for this uh, is, is is yes. I am going to claim that the that the evidence shows, I think, very very uh, conclusively, that that the language of these inscriptions is is an early form of Sanskrit or Indo-Aryan. And you're going to see why because I'm going to take you through it. This will take a little bit of time. So you know, I, I enjoy your patience, but there's really no other way to do this, I guess. Okay. So. Anyway, so the point being is that we have all this evidence that these inscriptions have metrological and numerical content. The question becomes, is there any way that we can leverage that as some sort of an entering wedge to, to generate perhaps more interesting information about the script? 
All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to another dichotomy. And this is that there are two fundamental types of inscriptions. By the way, uh, this, these terms pattern and complex, um, I think were first uh, used at least in published form by my colleague, uh, Brian Wells. Okay, so I wanna, wanna, wanna acknowledge his contribution here. Um, these two different types of, of, of and, and I mean, pattern might seem a little, bit, a little bit of a fatuous term because after all, they all have patterns, but what we mean is by pattern is that they're, that they're characterized by a particularly uh, rigid and predictable set of subfields, one of which we've already mentioned, described in some detail, the M field, okay? So this is a pattern, uh, an example of pattern inscription here. We've already, I think, seen this particular inscription, right? And uh, complex are simply inscriptions that are not resolvable into repetitive sign fields. And you can see an example in the bottom. By the way, that inscription at the bottom, humble though it be, is one of the most important of all of the Indus inscriptions. It is one of the oldest and most worn seals. Um, and what it says will blow your mind, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay. All right, so here's a, 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 a first of all, we'll deal with the complex inscriptions, okay? And there's the one I just talked about. Here's another one, which is very interesting. Uh, both of these uh, I have deciphered in, in whole. This one is a little more problematic. Uh, this one I've deciphered. This one is deciphered. This one is deciphered. Uh, let's see, this one is partly deciphered. This one is probably deciphered. This one is partly deciphered. And this one I've not made any progress with. Okay, so, so uh, but these are complex inscriptions. And as you just, just looking at them, you can sort of see that they look like what you think inscriptions look like. A bunch of signs in more or less random order, although it's far from random, of course, but it kind of looks like writing, okay? Um, but if you go to patterned inscriptions, you see something very different. You see the res resolution into four, at least four, and possibly more. I mean, there's more that could be said about this, but since I don't want to keep you here for five hours, you know, we're not going to do that. Um, but they resolve into, into four different fields, which I call the P field. P, by the way, is short for prefix. It doesn't mean that this is a prefix in the grammatical sense. It just means it's in the prefix or initial position when it occurs. Okay. Then the M field, which we've already talked about. M stands for metrology or measurement, by the way. C field, which stands for core. It's kind of a silly term, but I, I, I use it sort of as a, for, for my own purposes. So adopted or, or rejected, if you, if you will. And finally, the T field, uh, which I call the terminal for terminal. Uh, usually just one sign or at most two. And uh, this particular sign, the so-called jar sign, that's the, 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 the you know the vernacular uh, for this, is the number one most common sign in the, in, the, in the script. And we're going to have a reading for it much later on, but it's going to turn out to be a little more complex than, than, than we might think. Okay, now not all pattern inscriptions have all fields. So for example, this one here, which we've already seen, okay, only has a C field and a T field. Likewise, this one here. Okay, and let me see, I have some other examples. Here's some other examples. So this one only has an M field, a C field and a T field, but there's no P, P field over here. This one has a P field, but there's no M field. It just goes straight to a C field and then a T field. Okay, and this is, by the way, is a P field all by itself. Okay, so some of these can occur by, uh, by themselves. Um, so I, I don't want to spend too much time on these. You can look at them later. Again, there are many more examples in my in my 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 paper online. So let's just talk about them. The P field is sequentially the first or rightmost field in pattern inscriptions. It characteristically consists of two or more signs, the leftmost or final entry of which is ordinarily one of three what I call juncture signs: this sign, this sign, and this sign. Um, the meaning of these three signs is not entirely clear, okay? So, I mean, people have thought they might be case endings. My personal instinct is that they're probably not case endings, but they're, I don't think the script has case endings in point of fact, but um, it may be something similar, like it might have a, benefit, a benefactive or an honorific sense uh, to them, but I, I'm not entirely sure. Right? But the point is that they do mark, wh wherever they occur, they mark the end, the terminus, of a P field, okay? Now, P fields very often consist of only a single sign followed by this, by, 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 the, by, by this, uh, the, the juncture sign. And these include these here, this little thing that looks like a wheel, this one looks like a, 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 a chevron diamond, this thing looks like a big thick X and so forth. These are all very important signs and we'll have much more to say about them further on. Now, because these signs frequently occur alone with only a juncture sign following in the P field, okay? We can assume that each of these represents like a full word value of some sort, because the juncture sign, whatever it means, is clearly exiguous 
to whatever is going before, whether it is in fact a case ending or an honorific or something else. It's referring to whatever goes before, okay, as a totality. And in many cases, whatever goes before is a single sign. So the P field turns out to be a real nice way to isolate a whole bunch of signs that have got to be denotative of some sort of full word. And hence, basically logographs. Now the question becomes, what do they actually mean? And that's, 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 that's something else. We'll talk about that later, okay? All right, the C field will always occur third from the right, um, following or left adjacent to a P, well, to a P field and M field, where both of these fields are present, where neither, neither field are present, the C field will always be followed by, in other words, will be right adjacent to a T field. The ordering with, of signs within C fields is often quite random and reminiscent of complex inscriptions. Some common C fields, such as this sign here, consist of only a single sign. Okay, let's see if I, some, I don't have any examples. We'll see these later. And finally, the T field, which often consists of only a single sign. I've given a couple of examples here, um, particularly the, the, the so-called jar sign and what I call the arrow sign. It's also been called the spear sign. I think it's an arrow stylistically, but for reasons that will become apparent. And then there are a few others, which we, we, we could talk about, but I'm not gonna get into right now. now that's yet another sidetrack. Okay, so the keys to decipherment, again, repeat, repeat, which materials are notational, which are transcriptive? Well, I maintain that the notational stuff are the M fields and the T fields, the M fields for reasons we've already gone over. The T fields, because um, there's always usually just one of them. They definitely have, and, and as you'll see later, my, my, I am interpreting them in effect as very abbreviated versions of something else. On the other hand, the complex inscriptions, which we've talked about, as well as the C fields and P fields within uh, pattern inscriptions, seem to constitute the transcriptive data. That would mean the data most amenable to decipherment per se. Okay. In other words, this, the writing that correspond that, that's basically trying to spell out, in some sense, uh, you know, names, places, titles, voting inscriptions, whatever it happens to be. We don't know that yet, but it's being more or less spelled out in those fields. Okay, you can see, can you not, how simply taking, oh, okay, I'm sorry, you don't see my cursor, so just mention the reference. Okay, sorry. Still, st still uh, kind of new at this. All right. Yeah, so um, let me see. Um, so, so what was I saying? Yeah, so you can see why if, if someone, someone was were, were trying to decipher this and wanted to, let's say, r run a computer analysis of frequency of occurrence and which signs occur uh, adjacent to what with a view to, let's say, trying to establish what the word order is. If you just willy-nilly incorporate all of these M fields and T fields and treat them <clears throat> as completely equivalent to the rest of the text, then you're not going to get good results any more than you would learn a lot about, about English typology if you took a random uh, column out of an accountancy ledger or a paragraph <clears throat> out of a mathematics textbook and fail to take into account that a lot of what you're looking at is in fact numbers and other conventionalized signs and not actual writing, you know, transcriptive writing. Okay. So now that we've accomplished this, we can proceed with an attempt anyway to figure out what these inscriptions mean and what they say. Okay. So first let's go back to typology. And the question here is, do Indus inscriptions offer any clues about the typology of the underlying language? All right. Now, remember what I said. Typology has to do with things like word order. Um, people usually think of word order, but there are other things as well um, that can be clues about the language. Now, because of the brevity of these inscriptions, we don't seem to have, you know, have long paragraphs and things like this that we can analyze for a lot of these, these things like, like word order, apparently. Okay. But there is one interesting fact about the script. And, and as far as I know, I'm the first person to really notice this and, 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 and think about what that could actually mean, because it, it's, it's potentially uh, devastating to the case of people who insist dogmatically that this has to be Dravidian or language X or some, some you know, Munda, Proto Munda, whatever, what have you. Okay, so look at these three sets, particularly set one. This is really interesting. Here's this inscription, which we've seen many times in isolation, as well as this one. These are two common inscriptions. Well, actually, all three of these are very common incurring by themselves. Um, you'll notice that each one of them consists of a C, a C field followed by this T sign, the jar sign. Okay. And they occur very commonly as standalone inscriptions. And then we have this one down here. Okay. 
All right, and this occurs at least a dozen different times. So this is not an uncommon inscription either. All right, it, it doesn't. It occurs on a on a on a, on a like long skinny seal that doesn't have a field inscription. But anyway, well, first of all, we know what this is now, right? This is an M field, so we can sort of calve that off and say, okay, all right, what, that, that's 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 an M field. That's that's some sort of metrology thing. What do we have left? Well, what do we have? What we have left are three sign sequences glommed together. These three, in this order, right? First this then this, then this, and then only at the end, we have our friend, the jar sign, okay? And we see a similar pattern here. We have this C field and this C field, and then this inscription here, we see both of them together. And we see it again over here, something similar. Okay, notice that in this case, <clears throat> this single sign, which may be a compound, by the way, but it's a single sign, seems to represent, have the force of an entire word. But anyway, um, and there are many more examples, some of which are a little subtler, they're harder to tease out, and I just wanted to make these, but this one in particular just jumps right out at you. What does this say? Well, like what, likely what this is and what this is and what this is, in most general terms, it's a noun. It could be the name of a place, the name of a person, a title, the name of a god, the name of a, a tribe or clan or family, but it's probably a noun. Whether it's a common noun or proper noun, we don't know at this point. We will. Later on, I'll tell you what they mean, but not yet, okay? And here we have three nouns glommed together. Now, any one of you who is familiar with Indo-Aryan, particularly Sanskrit, but also Pali, um, will recognize this right away as being a very, very conspicuous typological trait of Indo-Aryan languages. And indeed, Indo-European. I mean, this is why German, for example, uh, and even English to some extent, uh, forms very, very lavish noun compounds to this day. This is an ancient typological trait of Indo-European. And it's probably it's most developed in the classical Sanskrit period. Those of you who've studied Sanskrit know that one of the most vexing things about learning Sanskrit is learning all of the different types of compounds, you know, the uh, Bahuvrihi compounds and the Dvandva compound. There are many different types as, you know, as cataloged by the Indian gra grammarians and then learning how to, to interpret them. OK, but even in the Vedic, in the earliest stages of the language, compounds were very much already an occurrence, particularly Dvandva compounds, for example, Mitra Varuna or Dhyava Prativi. These are God names that are basically two names glommed into one, okay? And here's the critical point. This is not a typological feature at any attested stage of Dravidian, okay? Dravidian also forms very long words, but not by compounding. Instead, it does by, by agglutination, meaning it tacks on lots of endings to the end. So there are lots and lots of, af there's lots of affixal material in Dravidian line, particularly Dravidian verbs, by the way. This is much more the case with verbs than with nouns, okay? But it doesn't form noun compounds. Well, it, it, but it also, it, also, it also occurs in the Vedic. Uh, it gets more and more lavish as you go, as you go on, but, it, but it's, it's a feature of Vedic as well. So you can consult McDonald or any of the, the, the best grammars of, of, of Vedic, and you'll see that you know, noun compounding also existed there. But by the, you know, the, cla the classical writers made greater and greater literary usage of it to the point where, as any, many of you know, you, know, you have an entire sentence that's basically a compound, or very nearly so. And it, and it makes, frankly, reading, uh, you know, something like the Raghu Vamsa or any of Kalidasa's works actually much more difficult than reading the Vedic uh, the Vedic materials, because even though the Vedic material, the grammar is more complex. So it has many early features um, of, of, of grammar that have pretty much disappeared by the time of classical Sanskrit. The verb in particular is much more luxuriant in Vedic Sanskrit, but the inscription, but, but because it doesn't compound to the incredible degree that you have in, 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 in Kalidasa and, and, and others, um, it, it, it's a little easier to read. Okay. It just, just, and I know this from personal experience. Okay, so my point being is we have this, this clue, and that this slide says the same thing. Yes, sorry, I, okay, so the cursor isn't visible. Um, I keep forgetting that, I'm sorry. I should say, I should have said, just going back here, I was referring particularly to set one, all right, uh, in the upper left. Um, so yeah, just look at set one and you can see, um, you, you can see, I guess, if you look at the fourth element under set one, MH4335, et cetera, in effect, you see a compound of, uh, of, of the three elements above it. 
in one. And in the other two sets, you can see uh, you can see uh, the two. Uh, again, you people can go back and, and look at this later. And so um, let, let's proceed. So clue number one, and this is a very important clue, the language of the Indus writing appears to form noun compounds. Okay. So now what we're going to do is assemble a few more clues, any of which taken individually could be written off as a, you know, a coincidence, but taken in the aggregate, I think furnish very strong circumstantial evidence that we're dealing, we're more likely dealing with Indo-Aryan than with Dravidian. And more to the point, once I adopted that assumption and used that as a starting point, it yielded, um, I think, wondrous results. So let's move on. So here's the next little thing. And this is, uh, first of all, I you know, point out that here we have two signs that, that seem to share this bow grapheme. And they seem to be, if not allographs, then allophonic or very similar because they frequently occur in the same context. All right. The one looks like a little, a little dude holding a bow and the other one just looks like a bow. All right. And they have been called the bow sign, the bowman sign by others, fair, fair service among them. So, the, you know, the graphology of the sign is... I would say fairly straightforward. That doesn't mean the sign means bow or bowman, but it does mean that perhaps that's that's involved. And this is an interesting fact. So the first thing to bear in mind is these two signs, whatever they their purport, they see there's a broad overlap in distribution. So we can probably assume that what we say of one, we can say of another. Uh, in particular, as I mentioned earlier, the bowman sign occurs in several instances in conjunction with what appears to be some sort of no, no, notation of metrology. You can see here in the line twos of these three inscriptions, it's occurring left adjacent, or in one case, right adjacent to, um, to that little U thing that looks like a, like a bowl or whatever. So these are interesting facts, but, but do they, what do they mean? So here's a question. Is there any attested language in South Asia in which the word for bow is similar to a word having to do with metrology or assets? In other words, is there a language in which the word for bow could plausibly have rebus value in such context? And I give the answer. The word for bow is dhanu, one of the two words for bow. The other one is chapa in Sanskrit, but dhanu. And the Sanskrit word for property, money, and wealth is dhana. So positing a value of dhan or dhana or something similar for the bowman sign in particular would make sense in an Indo-Aryan context, given the graphology and distribution of this sign. Okay. Again, could be coincidental, but it's an interesting fact and worth keeping in mind. So clue two, the language of the Indus writing appears to be one in which the word for bow is similar in sound to a word related to metrology or asset notation. Then we go back to our friend, uh, the staff sign, okay, which I say looks like a staff of grain or a piece of wheat or a piece of grass or something like that. And then next to it, a varied number of stroke numerals, as you can see in this slide, okay? So we've already said that's probably <clears throat> some, has something to do with metrology also. <clears throat> so the question, becomes, is there any attested language in South Asia in which a unit of measurement is somehow related to the idea of a staff of grain, grass, straw, etc., based on the, the graphology of the staff sign? So here's an example of potentially, as we did with the bow sign, exploiting the rebus principle after we've done the hard work of looking at what how the sign is distributed and what it's likely, what it's likely purport is, okay? And the answer that springs to mind is that one of the most important of all units of weight in Sanskrit is the pala, whose other meaning happens to be straw. And it's also, for those of you familiar with uh, Romance languages, cognate with Latin paleas, from whence Spanish paja, French pai, <clears throat> and other such words are derived. Okay, so it's actually a very old word, uh, an Indo-European word, as evidenced by the fact that it also is found in Romance languages. Okay, and um, denotative, at least in ancient India, of a particular rather heavy unit of weight. All right. So that's interesting. So clue three, the language of the Indus writing appears to be one in which the word for a particular unit of measurement, presumably weight, is reminiscent of grain, grass, straw, or some such, and we found a candidate. Again, in Indo-Aryan. Okay, finally, we get to this one. So this is, um, this is a really, really interesting thing. We have this, uh, this uh, pair of signs, the one with, that looks like a U, uh, and then left adjacent to that, the, 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 the triple stroke, the three, the three strokes, looks like the number three, right? But it occurs over and over again, almost always the leftmost element in an M field. And you may recall, I said earlier, that it seems to have meaning something like the amount of, or exactly, or some such. All right. 
Question, is there any attested word in the South Asian language likely to characteristically appear at the end of a notation of assets or mensuration? And the answer is the very common Sanskrit word matra, usually in the neuter matram, although it also occurs in the feminine, measure, amount, exactly, or in the amount of. It's very frequently found as a bound postposition after numerals and measures with the meaning exactly in the amount of or equal to. As in, and these, these examples, by the way, are, garnish, are garnered uh, straight from uh, Monia Williams Sanskrit Dictionary, krosa matre, at the distance of a kosh. That's, a, that's of course, a distance of, of length. Masa matre, in a month. Shatamatram, a, uh, a, hun, a hundred in number, exactly a hundred. And many other things like that, okay? So it also, by the way, the word matra also means a measure, which was a standardized, meaning a standardized measure. The word measure originally meant a particular unit of measurement that was standard <clears throat> to all others, okay? And uh, you can see this, for example, in the Old Testament, where it talks about, you know, a measure of grain or something like that, or a measure of wheat. That meant a specific amount, okay? So, so matra was also a, a small but consistent, conventionalized specific amount. So is there something about the appearance of the sign pair suggestive of the term matra? This is another interesting coincidence. If we assume that each of the two signs corresponds to a syllable, which I don't think is too far-fetched, then we end up with the likelihood that, that the first one is ma or ma or something like that, and the second one is tra. This is yet another compelling coincidence because tra happens to be one of the root forms for the number three in Sanskrit, the other being tri, tri and tra. Okay, And there's more we could add to that. This triple uh, stroke doesn't just occur after that little u sign that you see there. It occurs in a number of other instances at the in in in, in uh, inscription final position, almost as though it's acting like a suffix. And as it happens, tra is a common derivational suffix in Sanskrit. You know of it in words like gotra, matra, pitra, mitra. Well, not pitra. Mitra, patra, uh, kshatra, kshetra, and on and on and on. Well, Mitra is the name of, of course, the god or the word for friend. And the others, you know, Gotra is a clan, Kshetra is a field, or, and so forth and so on. Uh, Patra is a vessel. It's kind of a, a suffix, an all-purpose suffix that, mean, that, that, that refers to an implement, meaning the means by which something is done. Okay, so very interesting. Again, that we have a sign that looks like it sort of represents the number three that's occurring consistently in this affixal position, and particularly in this very common pair, exactly where you'd expect a word like Matra to occur. So again, taken by itself, it could be written off as a coincidence. But we're starting to accumulate some interesting coincidences that are telling us something, that are pointing in one direction and not in another. Okay, so clue four, the language of the Indus writing appears to be one in which there is a term typically found at the end of metrological numerical expressions, which term's second element is somehow related to the number, the numeral three. Again, if this, any of this seems far-fetched, I invite you to go through and actually peruse the materials. We don't have, I don't want to go, I don't want to pound people over the head with it. Uh, we, we have a limited amount of time. But all we, we now have four different clues that are pointing in the direction of Indo-Aryan, regardless of what, you know, the, the archaeological conventions may say. The inscriptions are telling an interesting story. Okay, now we have another interesting problem. If this sign uh, that looks like a staff of grain or whatever, is the unit of weight pala, as we've maintained. Well, why is it also found in complex inscriptions in P-fields and C-fields? Okay, like the fish sign, it also occurs in non-M-field contexts, in non-contexts with numerals and stuff like this. And you can see some examples of it here. Uh, for example, the first uh, in the first column, you can see it consistently occurs left adjacent to the sign that looks like a little square with a stick coming out of the top, okay? And it's, and it's occurring in, in those cases, well, MH2176 is actually a, uh, is a complex inscription, right? The other three in that column uh, end with the, with the terminal sign, it looks like a jar. So those are basically, it's occurring in a, in a C field. So data like this, uh, well, look at, look at MH9091 on the lower right. That's a, that's a really interesting one that we'll have more to say about later. There it's, ex it's occurring in a P field. The first field, okay, you can tell it's a P field because left adjacent to it, you have the two little doohickeys, the, 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 the little juncture sign. And then after that, there's a little numeral notation, and it occurs again in that same inscription, representing what we're assuming now is the unit of weight, the pala. Well, the, why does it occur in the first part of that inscription? What's it doing there? Okay, well, for many years, I was misled by this, and I thought, oh, well, that must mean that 
because it actually occurs in a number of different P fields. This, this, this staff side. Well, that must mean the P fields also must have something to do with assets. And I, I kind of went off on that rabbit trail for many years. And I didn't see the truth of it until only a few years ago. And that turned out to be the key that led to unlocking the entire problem. Okay. This data suggests that this, this sign has a second value consistent with use in transcriptive texts, perhaps names, titles, or something else. Okay. What could that use be? Well, it finally occurred to me, and this seems very obvious in retrospect, that it, it has a second meaning, and that is that in addition to standing for the unit of weight pala, it also stands for the word pala, which differs only in the fact that the ah is longer. Sa uh, Sanskrit differentiates between long and short vowels, and by that I mean literally longer and shorter in duration of utterance. So a uh versus ah, pala versus pala, okay? But pala, as it happens, is a very common word, meaning guard, protector, keeper. It's an extremely common final element in names and titles. And by extremely common, I mean if you run a database search of this, um, you'll get hundreds of different names and titles that end in this, is this term pala, including bupala, which is a common word for king or prince. It literally means protector of the earth. And <clears throat> dhanapala, which means treasure, i.e. money protector, and, and literally hundreds of others. And once I finally realized that this sign could actually have these two different denotata, similar but not exact, not not identical, uh, that would require, of course, an assumption that that the indescript does not encode differences in, in vowel length, which is a reasonable assumption. This is in the very early stages of the development of writing, and so one can't expect. I mean, this is millennia before Panini discovered and in, basically invented linguistics. Uh, so these writing systems are, are likely not going to be as sophisticated and subtle as modern writing systems in, in, in representing, um, you know, phonemic and phonetic differences and this kind of thing. So it appears to be potentially that they're conflating the ah uh and the ah, uh, and that this sign stands for both of these values. All right. So now we've obtained hypothetical sound values for four signs, thanks to inferences from the metrological uh, and numer numerical sign fields. Thanks, Scott. Um, these values as a first approximation are, so we have pala or pala, all right? Again, this is still hypothetical. We're going to use these as base values and see what happens. Okay, then we have dun or dana or something like that for the bow, bow sign. Well, for the bowman sign, and also incidentally for the, for, the, for, the, for the sign that looks like a bow but doesn't have a stick figure attached. I don't mention this in this list, but that's also there. Then we have ma or ma possibly. And finally, tra or tra. For the, for, the, for the large triple stroke. If these values are correct, then we've learned some interesting things. We've learned that value length, excuse me, that vowel length is not reflected in the script and that signs may have the form CV and CVCV because we have examples of both here. So our next task is to try to obtain other sign values using these signs as what I call anchor values and to see whether these values yield, yield plausible readings, okay? The, ni the nice thing about this approach is it is ultimately falsifiable and reproducible. If people will try what I tried, I will guarantee they will come up with the same results. All right. So <clears throat> let's start by noting that th th this common sign pair that looks like, you know, the bow sign and the left adjacent to that uh, in a number of, 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 of prefix type or, or p-field type context, one of which MH9091 we've already talked about, but you can see some other examples. Um, it's <clears throat> left adjacent to that is, is the staff sign, okay? And we already, as it happens, we already have plausible reading for that, which is dana pala. I mentioned it a minute ago. The first sign, dana, the second one, pala, and that means treasurer, which is kind of a, a word you might expect to find if we're correct in assuming that these inscriptions, particularly the, you know, the, 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 uh, the pattern inscriptions, have assets of, you know, metrology, uh, uh, assets, uh, wait, excuse me, notations of assets, meaning weights and measures, possibly denoting property or transactions or something like that. You might expect a treasurer to be involved with that. So that's an interesting coincidence. Again, I don't know if we've proven anything yet, but we've certainly accumulated a lot of coincidences. So now we have some other, in, uh, another common, the other common pairing that we showed, which is the, um, the staff sign and then right adjacent to that, the little sign that looks like a box with a stick coming up out of it. Okay, it's a pretty common sign. Um, it occurs fairly randomly. And uh, we have a lot of information about it. And I've, 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 I've tabulated that on, on this slide. So again, trying to remember, I don't have my pointer. Uh, you can see 
some instances where 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 it occurs um, uh, right adjacent to the bow sign or the Bowman sign. The first couple of examples, you can see some examples where it's right adjacent to the the sign that we've identified as ma, potentially provisionally. You can see a couple at the bottom of that first paragraph, the left paragraph, where it's occurring as the absolute final element in a couple of um, complex inscriptions, okay, which may be names or something. And then a couple, and then several examples uh, on the right where it occurs right adjacent to Pala, to our friend Pala, okay? So from this data, we can assemble a sort of mini dossier of this particular sign and see if the assumed anchor values that we have already yield a plausible value. Okay, so we have X Dana, we have X Ma, we have X Pala, and we have the fact that X also occurs quite frequently. I gave two examples here, but we could multiply those. Occurs as the final element in a name. So those are our data. And the question is, do they yield <coughs> one or more plausible values? Well, how do we find out? The way we find out, <coughs> excuse me, throat starting to give out. The way we find out is we go to an online searchable database, which is searchable by substring, and we test it. And what we do is we, we enter, for example, Dana or done or something like that as a word middle element and have it generate a list of everything <clears throat> in which Donna has something in front of it, okay? And we make a list of everything there, okay? And then we make, and then we look at ma and we do the same thing with a syllable ma and then we do the same thing with a syllable pala. And we compare those three lists and see where the overlap is. This is the basic method that I use and it's called cross-checking. And it so happens that there is an online searchable database of Sanskrit, uh, issued by the University of, maintained by the University of Cologne, although the original version that I use has been unfortunately done away with. It was actually more, less, more useful for this purpose than the version they have right now. But anyway, there's also wisdomlibrary.com has a, has a searchable database that includes more than just one dictionary <clears throat> and includes lexicons of all sorts and, and also stuff that isn't Sanskrit. So you have to be careful because, you know, you have to make sure that you have to check on all the, the possibilities. I didn't start using that until, until much later. Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is this is so this is what we have. So here for this sign, as it turns out, okay, uh, of course those three uh, searches that I did generated very long lists, particularly ma, huge list, thousands of answers. By the way, the, the source was the online searchable Monier Williams Sanskrit dictionary, okay. So I kind of used that, but it, it, to start with, and then you know you use some others eventually. But this is this is the basic principle, okay, and by I think grotesque good luck, there was only one possible value for the sign that actually agreed with all these parameters. Only one. Okay. And that is the value given here, boo or boo. Okay. So in front of the bowman or the bow sign, you get boodana, which is another word for king or prince. Okay. In front of the ma, you get buma, which is the Com, you know, combined form or shortened form of Buman, which also means king or prince, another word for another title word. And in front of Pala, you get Bhupala, which is yet another word for king or prince. Sanskrit is nothing if not rife with synonyms. Okay, Bhupala is by far the most common. It occurs very often. It's one of the most, that, that sign sequence there is one of the most common, uh, you know, digraphs in the, in the Indus uh, corpus. And then finally, in final position, well, bu also means born of or arising from, and it's a very common final element in names and titles, okay? So born of X would be written X bu in Sanskrit, and that's going to be important later on. We'll talk about that. So that was the only value, and I thought, okay, well, it, it seemed almost too easy. So, but then that became <coughs> my fifth, <coughs> excuse me, my fifth anchor value. And using this method of cross-checking, I just proceeded to, and, it was, and at first it was exceedingly tedious because it would generate sometimes lists of, you know, more than a thousand possibilities. And I'd have like two or three different lists with 500, a thousand different entries. And I have to go through and compare and look at this and look at that. Sometimes I, even after I was done, I would end up with, you know, 10 viable possibilities. And I have to set that aside and work on another sign. And then eventually would get, you know, would be able to, to eliminate some of those possibilities because some other sign would, you know, the meaning would become clear. As time went on, when I finally figured out how to do this out of years of work, um, after years of work, it actually came together fairly, fairly quickly in the period of about five or six months, particularly the first three months. Um, this was following more than three decades of, of, of preliminary work. 
But nevertheless, this method of cross-checking turned out to be extremely uh, fruitful. And these were the five initial values that I assumed. I said, okay, we're going to use these five as anchor values. We're going to say we're going to propound a hypothesis, a double hypothesis. Number one, we are dealing with a form of Indo-Aryan. And number two, these signs have approximately these values. And then see what, what cross-checking would yield. And I was encouraged by the fact that I it came up with this boo rather easily. Um, that was somewhat deceptive. Some of the other signs, I mean, I can remember times when I would stay awake 16 hours, you know, work 16 hours straight, particularly during COVID. Um, I was living in China at the time, didn't have much else to do. Um, I was locked down a lot of the time. And so I literally had to do this or perhaps uh, risk uh, mental illness under those conditions. So this was one of the way, the, the way that I whiled away the time uh, during COVID. Uh, and at a particular juncture, my father passed away of COVID in the United States, and I was unable to attend his funeral because I couldn't leave the country and, and, and come back. So I had to attend. So, so this was a, a fairly stressful time. And uh, I guess you can say that, that, that I put it to good use um, because, because, let's see. So, so here is the basic method, just to repeat. So I had these phonetic values, you know, potential phonetic values assigned to five common signs, adopted uh, the following methodology. I restricted my attention to the three transcriptive domains of the corpus aforementioned, the P fields, the C fields, the complex inscriptions, use the cross-checking method in conjunction with any other distributional clues, and of course, occasionally, um, graphological clues, the appearance of the sign, to obtain several dozen more sign values which we then tested and retested, making every effort to falsify them. And I deliberately restricted my initial work to the Mahadevan Concordance, um, in part because of my profound respect for the late Mahadevan, who was a colleague of mine um, some years ago. Um, in any event, uh, and then after I obtained the results, I checked them against the newer uh, interactive court, uh, Concordance of Indus texts put together by, um, by Andreas Fools and, and Brian, and, um, and Brian Wells. It's available online and in some ways more useful. One of the things that it has is it has pictures, images of almost every inscription in there. So you can actually look at the image, see whether you agree with what's there, look at, see the context. It's, it's really, and you can also do substring searchable stuff there too. But I, I didn't, I, I held off using it because I wanted to have something that I could then uh, reproduce, re reproduce on falsifiable. And what I found out was that the results I got from the, from, from the initial results, the first iteration of this, from the Mahadevan concordance alone was almost entirely correct, but the ICIT did falsify like two sign values because there were a couple things that had been, a couple signs that had been improperly, um, had been conflated by Mahadevan and his concordance that the ICIT pretty much proves are distinct signs. So I had to drop zero, but it also gave me a couple of new signs because it had some data from the Dolavira and material and other, and other places that are not in, in the Mahadevan concordance. And I found a number of inscriptions that 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 worked really nicely with these values, one of which really shook me up. We'll talk about later. So first, I'm going to present what just the results. We'll just go through these quickly. You can see these online. So here are some CV type syllable signs that resulted from this. A couple you've seen already. Others you have not. Notice um, here in the right column we have Su one and Su two. There are a few signs that seem to have that seem to be basically homophones or near homophones, and I can't I haven't always determined what the difference is. So this is by far the final say. This is the next iteration, okay? Um, let's see what else we have here. Here are some CVC or CVCV type syllable signs, a bunch of those um, that we were able to get. And again, these, these emerged <clears throat> by the same cross-checking method. Um, notice, for example, if you go to the second column and go about a little over halfway down, you see the so sign looks like a pair of tongs or a crab. And it's reading, it turns out, is Vasu or Vasu. That's one of the signs that crops up frequently in the prefix, um, in the P field context. And we'll see more about that later on. And it turns out to be uh, this very common and important uh, word. Um, but uh, anyway, all of which is again explained in the hundreds of pages in my actual monograph. Here are some other syllable signs. <clears throat> There's our friend Tra in the lower right. In the lower left, Ati, At, Ati, Adi, Ati. This is an extremely important sign as it will turn out and was another major clue to unlocking not just the signs themselves, but what the script actually said. All right, here are some signs that I, I, I deem logograms. There are quite a few of these. These just seem to uh, represent words. Notice, by the way, in the middle of the right column, um, there are actually two distinct 
types of signs that look like quadrupeds. One, one type faces left, which I think, and again, I don't think this just because of what it looks like. I think it is because of what it, the, the context in which it occurs, bear this out. The value seems to be something like Ashva, which means horse. Okay, I don't know how it was actually pronounced. Remember this language, this is a version of Sanskrit antecedent probably by many centuries, if not millennia, to the earliest forms of, the, of Vedic. So many of the, the, the actual pronunciations of these words may have been quite different. Okay, the other animal, the other quadruped sign faces to the right, and it seems to represent a cow, hence the value go. Anyway, um, I'll say more about these later. Um, ligatured compound signs. Um, these are signs that are actually lig ligatures, and um, yeah, they all make sense too. But uh, all right, um, let's see. These, I think I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. We used quite a bit of time already. Um, so the first sign, the wheel sign, uh, it turns out that this sign represents the syllable deva, which, as you probably know, means God. Of course, some of these words, by the way, still exist in modern Indian languages thousands of years later. It's remarkable. Uh, everybody in India knows what deva means, okay? Uh, it means God or Lord. It also means a noble person. Uh, it can be used as a title. Um, and so I give some ex some examples here. I think the second inscription on this page is particularly interesting. This one has the wheel-like sign repeated three times. And I, you know, I looked at that and, and, and actually I, once I, I had the one in the, in the middle, deva ti deva, um, I arrived at the values of those signs and I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I, I have pretty good knowledge of Sanskrit, but I'm not an Indian Brahmin. I don't have, you know, Brahminical level understanding of Sanskrit. I'd never seen that before. I thought, I wonder if deva ti deva actually means anything. And I looked it up and sure enough, it's a common epithet means you know, God of all gods, or God surpassing all gods, Devati Deva, or, or Devadhi Deva uh, as well, and so forth. Um, and you can see it occurs in other other contexts as well. I, I just, I'd like to take you through this, but that would take hours and hours more to, to go through all the details of this. But suffice it to say, that is what the wheel sign represents. It represents the, the common word Deva. Um, um, and yeah, let's just leave it at that. The next one is another word that everybody in India knows the meaning of, and that's pati, because pati in the feminine version, patni, of course, are still around. They mean husband and wife in modern day Hindi and other Indian languages, but they have, they've existed almost unchanged in the Indo-Aryan languages of South Asia from, since the earliest form of Sanskrit, okay? And that turns out to be the meaning of the chevroned diamond sign, okay? Uh, it turns out to mean pati. And the feminine form is the form that has the little sign you can see near the bottom of, uh, there's MH4427. It has left adjacent to it the sign that looks like a, a slanted line with a little nose sticking out of it. That's ni. And that's actually patni. Uh, so that's the, the feminine form. And you see that quite often as well. Um, this sign, unlike deva, uh, if you go through deva, you'll see, I don't know if I have any examples here, but there's some examples of of this where the sign is is, is, is geminate. There's a two wheel signs side by side, which presumably represents deva deva, which also is a common term. It means it, it's like an emphatic way of saying God. There is no expression pati pati, however. And it's interesting that this sign never occurs uh, geminated, uh, the, 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 the chevron diamond sign. So anyway, uh, again, this sign we know has to have the purport of a single word because it so frequently occurs in that P, uh, that P field all by itself with nothing but a juncture sign next to it. Usually the, the, the double tick juncture sign. Okay, that's a very, and there it is. You can see it actually in combination with another sign in uh, MH4470. You see there, there, there's Pati with a little double tick uh, left adjacent to it. And it happens to be preceded by the sign uh, Saha, uh, but that's, that's another story. Anyway, um, so anyway, so a, lot of, so a lot of those P signs literally mean something like for or to or on behalf of the God or on behalf of the Lord or something like that. That's all it means. But, and we'll see what that means contextually later on. Okay, now here's the one that really, I had a, took a long time to accept what the data was telling me. And that is that this funny little sign that looks like, a, 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 well, actually a little bit like a crescent moon. I think it was, um, might have been uh, Parpola that, that 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 claimed that it was representing a crescent moon. Anyway, that what it really meant was that was the word Raja, however that was pronounced thousands of years ago, which is the stand, you know, probably the most important word for king. Again, everybody from India knows what Raja means. 
and it has different forms, Raja, Rajan, and so forth. Um, but that's what it means. It means king. And you'll notice uh, that the form Rajani, which is Rajani, uh, uh, queen, also occurs uh, on this on this uh, slide down near the bottom, MH uh, 1108 and MH 7207. You have a couple of examples. Uh, the second one is really interesting. You have Raja Rani, king and queen, together, because that little one that looks like the two intersecting circles, the value for that is Ra. All right. Onward ho. Okay, now we come at last to our little friend, MH3105. This one is possibly, uh, I mean, the most significant uh, inscription that I deciphered in full. It is on a very, very worn seal with the typical um, unicorn bull motif. I believe it's from, well, from Mahendra Daro. And um, that is what it says. Ati Raja Suma Pu. Well, when I first saw Suma, those two characters, uh, the, 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 the second and third characters from the left in that, in that inscription, this is the top inscription on this page, uh, that occurs in many different inscriptions. Suma, 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 sometimes by itself as a word. And there is no word Suma in Indo-Aryan. I, I, and this perplexed me for weeks. And then one day, the worm turned. I thought, what if it means Soma? Again, another word that anyone who has even a passing acquaintance with uh, Hinduism knows what Soma means. It was one of the most important uh, gods in, 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 the, in the Vedic pantheon. It was also an intoxicating beverage that the, that the priests would drink in their rituals. Very, very important word. And also a common element in, in names, right? In, in Sanskrit names. Well, looking at this, Soma Bhu, I thought, well, Soma Bhu uh, would be a name. I mean, it makes sense as a name. I wonder if it is actually a real name. Well, I looked it up. Not only is it a name, it is a name of the uh, I mean, uh, it is the, the name of the legendary founder of the Lunar Dynasty and other people as well. It's a, it's a well-attested, but, but very in, in the mythology of, of ancient India, very important name. And what this seal's inscription reads is Ati Raja Somabu, High King Somabu. Now, I'm not saying that this is the same guy. Um, I am saying that at some time uh, in the history of this, this civilization, there was a king by the name of Somabu. So that, that to me was just a remarkable result. And all the more for the sense, and of course this isn't falsifiable because for all you know, I could, be, I could be lying, but I'm telling the truth. I had never heard this name. I had never heard of this king or anything else uh, before I read this inscription based on values for these signs that I had, uh, you know, had, had ascertained by this method of cross-checking. And I happened to look at this. And, and then when I found that name Somabu and, and read about who this person this mythological personage was, I, I can't tell you that that was probably the time when I realized, wow, we're onto something here. All right. Anyway, um, you also notice there are a couple of instances where the where the Raja sign is geminate, like in the next two inscriptions here. You have uh, Ati Raja Raja, or Ati Raja Raja, which turns out to be a an attested term also, particularly in inscriptions. The Indian epigraph epigraphical glossary has been scanned into the aforementioned Wisdom Library. Uh, database. And that's very useful, as it turns out, because it includes all these inscriptions from, from early, very early historical and, and proto-historical India, um, and gives you some idea of what might be found in inscriptions from prehistoric India, from well, what, what I'm now arguing is, is we're, we're in the process of pulling out of prehistory and making this a historic civilization by assigning a language to it, and by coming up with the names of some of its eminent personages that appear on these seals. Okay. Anyway, let's keep going. Time is passing. The X-like X sign seems to be the very ancient equivalent of the word Suri or Shri, which again is a name, a term. Nowadays, it's almost always used. It's not used by itself. It's used with, you know, you, you know, like, <clears throat> uh, you know, Sri uh, Mahadevan or something like that um, with, with a name. But anciently, it was, would, would have been used as a separate, a separate word. And it's probably related to the, to the word Suri, in the same way that Mr. comes from Monsieur, which comes from Monseigneur in French, you know, the tendency sometimes to take these, these commonly used title words and, and collapse them into something, um, you know, conventionalized and perhaps unrecognizable. A suri meant uh, like, hero, like heroic one or something like that, learned man or sage originally. So that's what this, this means. Um, 
Then there's Vasu, which we talked about before, and I'm not going to go into the arguments as to how we got to it, as how I got to this reading, but this is another one that forced itself upon me by virtue of the fact that it occurs not only in these uh, peak uh, field contexts, but also in another context that sort of looks like another expression of of, of property or assets for reasons that I won't go into now, but it turns out Vasu also means property or treasure. Um, and it also fits very nicely into the other inscriptions here, um, which you can look at at your leisure. Okay, and then here's some readings of complex inscriptions. I think we're gonna gloze over most of these. We mentioned many of the more important ones, but here's a good one. Uh, second one from the bottom here, MH4010. 40, 40, um, it's from Harappa, by the way, that's what H1 means. Uh, Shri Sukadeva is what, how that one reads. Um, and you can see the other ones, you know, the second one from the top, Vasudeva Pati, uh, Satyadevaka, the first one, uh, and so forth and so on. Um, so what we're seeing is, and what should be, be, be becoming obvious, is the complex inscriptions, at least, are simply names of people, sometimes with an honorific affixed to them, but that's what they are. Uh, very, they, they, none of the ones that I've deciphered seem to be anything else but, but names. There's our friend again, At Atiraja Sumabhu, and then right underneath it, Atima Suka. Okay, so there's Atima. Uh, th th this is Ati with Ma, which reads Atima, but actually is, uh, again, it took me several weeks to figure out what that meant, but I finally was, ah, it must mean Atma. Okay, which of course is found in a very, it means soul originally, and may well have originally been been Atima, meaning something like, uh, you know, ati, Atiman, because uh, Atman is the form that we have in attested Sanskrit, but um but and it's and its origin, the origin of the word is uncertain. Um, what that actually means, where the Atman comes from. Um, but my hypothesis based on this is it actually originally was Atiman, which means something like high mind or supreme mind. Okay. And then what happened was something that linguists called compensatory lengthening, where the ati, which is a short a, became at in, to compensate for the loss of that intermediate e in later Sanskrit. So atima. Atiman, Atima became Atma. So that's how we read it. Anyway, Atma Sukha is an attested name. Um, and here's another name for a king, which I couldn't find any, any you know, it's, it's, a it's a name, but not, not as a king name or anything legendary like, uh, like, like Somabu. But uh, this occurs on several inscriptions. Atiraja Somin. Somin, Somin means uh, the performer of Soma sacrifice or the Soma priest. So I thought that was a very interesting word as well. And then uh, this next one uh, in the middle of the page, MH2114 uh, from um, Mahendradar. This is a very, very clear inscription on, uh, from a very well-preserved seal. And it reads Ravi Prabhu, which is a name. It means literally born of Ravi. Okay. So anyway, and the second from the bottom is another one that I, I like in particular. Atima Rakshaka. That simply means bodyguard or protector. All right. And the one at the bottom is, is, is incomplete, but again, the re reading there, Rati Sena Bu, could either be short for something like Rati Sena Bu Pala or Bu Mana, mean, Bu meaning one of those Bu words that means prince or lord, or it could just mean Rati Sena Bu, meaning born of Rati Sena. Rati Sena is a very, very well attested name, including a king's name. And by attested, by the way, I mean attested from, you, mostly from Puranic sources, but basically attested from actual Sanskrit, right? Uh, and we're finding these attested names and titles in this earlier, what's turning out to be an early form of Sanskrit. Um, this is the one of the part of, of, of top of part three here, Lakshmana Devaka is very interesting because um, this, this suffix sign that looks like the little box with the hatches across it and the stick coming out stands for the symbol ka or ka. And this, in, you know, in attested Sanskrit usually is an attributive suffix. So the word Devaka means divine, sometimes is synonym with deva, but not as much. But in this earlier version of Sanskrit, it seems to be also uh, not just an attributed, but it also seems a possessive. It seems to have an almost a genitive possessive sense. So Lakshmana Devaka could mean belongs to Lakshmana Deva, or it could be the, that that's the name, Lakshmana Devaka, either one, I'm not sure. Um, the sign uh, that uh, you can see at the beginning, the, the rightmost in MH5124, that looks like a little box with various hatch marks inside, turns out to represent the sound para or pra, okay, either one. And interestingly, that sign does occur by itself as a standalone uh, C field, implying that it also has some sort of value as a name. Well, guess what? 
a very common, well-attested early Puranic name is Para. It's a name of a number of kings and so forth. I never knew this. I'd never heard this. And that's probably not something that a lot of people even in India know unless they've studied a lot of early Vedic Sanskrit, because it's not the sort of name that's come down to us as much, but it's here in the inscriptions. It also ends up being used sometimes for the prefix pra, as in prabahu, you can see in the inscription that I just that I just referred to. All right, let's see here. Okay, so so let, let's go to the T field. Um, what the jar sign and arrow sign mean? A lot of people have assumed that these are some sort of case affix markers, um, and for good reason, and I, I, I started out assuming that myself. But there's some reasons to reject this assumption. I'll go over them fairly quickly. Um, they frequently occur to the left of sign sequences like fish or oval clusters that demonstrably represent multiple coordinated lexemes. <clears throat> in this case, you know, units of measurement or weight, such as in the underlying sequences in the following two examples. So if they represent grammatical affixes like a gender marker or a case ending or plural marker or something like that, number marker, uh, why would they, why would there only be one, you know? Uh, following what's clearly a sequence of, of of multiple lexemes, okay. Then, then you also have the thing that, this, that, that the sign that looks like a jar has several other forms uh, that are akin in graphology but differ strikingly in distribution. And these are the ones that have the little hick, uh, tick marks in the middle. Um, so they're usually found in rightmost position or elsewhere, where in the P field environment rather than in T fields. So if you assume that they're somehow related to or derived from, you know, it, it's hard to see how. If, if the jar sign by itself is a grammatical affix, you know, what these derivative signs would be, especially since they often occur in absolute initial position, which is not where you'd expect a grammatical affix like a case ending to occur. So it, 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 it's, it, it definitely muddies the waters. Um, and then also if you interpret that sign and other analogous terminal signs like the, like the, the, the arrow sign, as a grammatical affix, it would kind of suggest a very well-developed system of affix marking as against a comparatively impoverished logo syllabary. However, the Harappan signary is comparatively lacking in signs that occur both frequently and randomly, suggesting a paucity of simple phonograms. This is precisely the reverse of what we would expect for a script with a supposedly well-developed system for representing case affixes. Given that ancient writing like proto cuneiform and early Maya only began representing grammatical affixing well after the initial invention of writing and the creation of complete signaries. What I'm arguing here is that the version of the script that we find on the seals and other related artifacts, whether or not it represents a subset of a greater, like a literary script that's found in other, that was written on birch bark or, or palm fronds or whatever, but has since all perished, or whether it represents the sum total of the usage of that script. Either way, what we're seeing is a script specifically designed to condense and to represent ideas in as condensed and compressed a state as possible. So bear that in mind as we proceed with my interpretation of these T signs. My interpretation, and I have to um, say this is not my original idea. This was thought up by my master's thesis advisor decades ago, John Robertson who suggested to me, he's actually a Mayanist himself, but he suggested to me after looking at, at, at my material, he said, you know, for me, he said, that, 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 that jar sign thing, it, to me, it looks like a predicate. And that had never occurred to me, that, that that one sign could represent something by itself, something as complex as a verb, whether a Dravidian verb or an Indo-Aryan verb, they're both very complex. They have lots of affix morphology and so forth and so on. Um, so that, that just didn't occur. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, that, that, that feels right. And so, <clears throat> What I think these T signs represent are predicates, specific common predicates, as we'll mention in a moment. And they don't, uh, obviously, you know, verbs in Sanskrit have many different endings, okay? Uh, but I don't think that that was deemed important. They simply represent the basic idea. So I represent, I represent this, the value of the sign as as, A-S, capital letters. And that could be readable as asti, santi, or many other forms, however they were read or printed. But the, but the crucial thing is that this word, as anyone who speaks a South Asian language, even a modern South Asian language knows, is that the verb to be is used as an aerial typological feature means to belong to. So, you know, to say, you know, um, I have $20, you say, you know, there are $20 to me or something like that. And that works in, in, uh, in, in Sanskrit as it does in Hindi, as it does in Tamil uh, and so forth and so on. In Singhala, it's, uh, it's pretty much a, a, a universal. And so it also, of course, us can also mean is equivalent to. Uh, is equal to. 
So for all these reasons, it struck me that the most likely meaning for the jar sign per se is it represents the copula. That's what linguists call the to be when it's expressed overtly. It's, it's called a copula, okay? Um, and that, um, so it's basically a root sign, as it were, and all other phonetic information is suppressed. It's not needed. So we don't need to have signs representing all the different affix and so forth because, you know, so forth. And here's what I just said. The root can have these different meanings in Sanskrit. <clears throat> and the most likely value for the arrow sign is ish, where it means be re accepted, regarded as a worth. And it also <clears throat> might mean there's a near hominin ish, which means own or possess. The interesting point here is not only that that is a, another predicate that you would expect in these contexts, it's also reminiscent of the Sanskrit word for arrow, which is ishu, one of two major words for arrow, again. Um, so that was a significant thing. Um, so that's my postulate here. That's my hypothesis for the meaning of those two signs. Um, now, on the other hand, the, the, the signs where you have the, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the jar sign with little ticks inside, I think those are nominalizations. A nominalization is when you take a verb or an adjective, as the case may be, and turn it into a noun. Okay. And as, as it happens, the nominalized form of the copula to be in South Asian languages is often used to denote property. So for example, I mean, the, the word asti in modern Hindi, as well as in, is in Tamil, but Hindi in particular, means property, okay? Um, and there's a word in Sanskrit, asti mat, which means having property. Mat is, a, is an affix in Sanskrit, a very productive affix, which means possessing or having or owning, okay? So I assigned the, these three signs, the meaning asti, property. Um, what the difference is among them, I'm not sure. <clears throat> they could, it could have to do with, um, with the number of possessors or of things possessed, or it could be something entirely different, or it could be arbitrary. I don't know, because um, they're all pretty much fungible, as they are. But that's my hypothesis. Okay, well, what sort of information, and this is the final segment here, se section, what sort of information do the pattern inscriptions contain? Well, given what we know about the nature of P, M, C, and T fields, what is the overall meaning of pattern inscriptions with their names, titles, and asset notations? What does it tell us about the functions of the seals? And it turns out all of this fits together really nicely in the end. As you'll see, it squares with archaeological data and what we know about Indian culture going back thousands of years and so forth. So first of all, just to point out again, we do know without any shadow of a doubt that some seals and tablets clearly contain only asset notations. So here's a recap of that. And for good measure, um, I list the field object and the artifact type. So you can see we have a, a number of examples of full-blown seals with a field object, a field figure, an animal or whatever, standard artifact, okay? With an inscription that's basically a stroke numeral plus one of these signs that we've identified as, 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 as likely metrology, very links. Okay, so there's no doubt that, that, that these type of inscriptions, I mean, you look at these inscriptions, how can you possibly say, oh, well, those, that's a votive inscription to something like that? It, it doesn't make any sense. So we know that. Uh, and I, and I, I think it's fair to say we really do know that some of these inscriptions have to have numerical metrological purport. There they are. Okay, these aren't these aren't little scrawlings on potsherds, although there are potsherd scrawlings also that probably indicate carrying capacity or so forth that have inscriptions like this, but they're also found on seals. So that's important. So the next most form of complex of, of inscription with an M field is the type stroke numeral, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the, 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 the staff sign plus stroke numeral plus a, plus a P cluster. Okay, such as the two examples given here, you can see them. So what does this mean? Well, based on what we're saying, it means something like four palas, in the case of the first one, uh, for the Lord or to the Lord or on behalf of the Lord or so something like that. And the, the second one means something similar, except the word deva, God, or perhaps Lord. It could represent some high secular authority like a high priest. We don't know. There's some confusion. So, you know, I mean, that would mean that the juncture sign represents a noun case or case-like relationship, maybe a genitive or dative case or an honorific, uh, honorific sense or a benefactive sense, any of these possibilities. I don't, and I don't know which one at this point. This is one of the many, many things uh, left to, to, be, to be resolved. But you can see the basic meaning, two or four, the God or gods, two or four, the Lord or Lord, something like that, and then a certain amount, four palas. Well, you know, that seems kind of weird. What are we talking about here? All right. Why would we have it? Well, these readings make perfect sense if we bear in mind a couple of key facts. Anciently, temples functioned as banks, both for lending and depositing. 
This was the case in both the ancient Middle East and the Mediterranean. In India, temples to this day, temples have been centers of banking for millennia and in many cases still have enormous holdings of wealth accumulated from untold centuries of donations. Okay. I mean, it's, it's a fact today. In fact, the current uh, government, uh, Modi's government, has been trying to get some of these very, very wealthy centuries-old Hindu temples to disclose all of their, you know, their holdings and so forth. Uh, it's, been, it's been a bit of an issue. But that's because before banks were invented, there were temples. And this was equally, I mean, th th this was equally true with the, the, in the ancient Mediterranean world, the Romans, uh, for example. The word money, by the way, comes from the word, uh, from, from the goddess, uh, uh, the, the Roman deity, Juno Moneta whose temple was particularly known for, uh, and it means literally Juno the warner from the, from the Latin word monere, which means to warn or admonish, right? But because that temple became such a, a prominent center of banking in ancient Rome, the word moneta became, you know, became the word for coin, actually. And in fact, you know, in English, it's a more general term, but, it, but in French, monet means coin, moneda in Spanish, another derived word means coin. So that's where it came from, all right? Well, the same was true in the ancient Middle East and certainly in India. So the most likely interpretation of seal inscriptions like the two we've just read is that they recorded deposits of assets at a temple or temple treasury for which the seal was issued in exchange as a claim on those assets, which could presumably be used to redeem them, or as an earnest in other transactions, establishing credit, credit worthiness, for example. As such, such seals probably functioned as early for, uh, similar to the mo modern letters of, letters of credit. There is, however, another possible interpretation. Um, it's also plausible that these, or at least some of such inscriptions, were donative in character, recording some significant donations or oblations, which then became badges of honor, as it were, for the donors. Donative inscriptions of this kind, which sometimes seem to have been accorded talismanic portent, were often inscribed not only on temple and cave walls, I'm talking about post-Harappan India now, but also on pottery and other objects and were a significant feature of proto-historical and historical Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain India. So a quote from Matthew Milligan, the chief researcher in this, um, he says, quote, a donative inscription, whether Hindu, Buddhist, or Jain, may function simultaneously as a written administrative record, a panegyric record, and or as a special type of magical device which perpetually earns merit for the name donor. So it's not entirely clear whether we're dealing with donative inscriptions, whether we're dealing with recordings of deposits, uh, or both, or perhaps all of the above. But it is clear that it was done apparently through the instrumentality of ancient, you know, temples, whatever they may have been. And as I, I hasten to add, we've not actually identified any temples yet, but now we know they must have existed just based on what we're inferring from the meaning of these inscriptions. So then we have other examples of, of inscriptions here, inscriptions of this sort where you simply have, you know, a, like an arrow sign with, with a, a P cluster uh, or something like that. I don't have time to go into all the details here, but you, again, you can look at the, look at the paper. Um, to see the details for how all these explain, but these are essentially the same. These don't name a donor or donee. They simply say, you know, owns such and such an amount. So like the first one in the upper left, you have, <coughs> you owns whatever the amount denoted by those three fish signs happens to be, or possibly worth such and such an amount, either one. Okay. And then on the right, you have versions where, it, you know, it's worth such and such an amount, and then it has the usual attribution to a God or an authority. Okay. And so let's see. So we, we just talk, we talk about this. I analyze them a little bit more. I think I'm going to skip some of this. Um, the simple inscription, what you see there, uh, occurs several times by itself, is probably simply means is worth one measure or owns one measure of something that everybody back then knew what it was referred to, but we don't know. Because of course, metrology and these types of things are often highly conventionalized and specific to time and place. In fact, I mean, the very values of many of these Indian weights uh, like the like like the, like the tola and the pala and and uh, the uh, what's the other the, the karsha and others um, you know o over time the the the, ma uh, the masha masha uh, these are these are very important ancient Indian weights and measures but they have many different values depending on what time time you're talking about and even geographical location okay all right so anyway and I think we're going to skip over this too because I'm I know I'm taxing the patience of however many of you are left here but Suffice it to say that these even more complex versions of pattern inscriptions <coughs> are as, consists of essentially a notation of assets attributed to somebody and being made on behalf of some authority or another, whether it's a king, whether it's a god, whether it's a temple treasurer, 
or something like that. Okay, and let's see. I think we're just gonna, I'm gonna breeze through these. Here's an interesting one. Um, these these don't have asset measurements, but uh, notice the re reading of that first inscription, which we've seen a lot in this presentation. It turns out to be bahuja, those three signs. And bahuja is a term for kshatriya. So the, 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 so there were a lot of kshatriyas in this culture. And that's sort of interesting since, again, the lunar dynasty was supposedly a kshatriya dynasty. But anyway, um, and then the other one you see underneath that uh, at the bottom uh, means belongs to or property of the king or the earth lord. And this term bhupala may have referred to, a, I'm speculating here, but since it's never used with like ati or some superlative like that, it may refer to a local sovereign or prince or duke or baron or something, what we would call a duke or baron or something like that. Whereas the term raja or ati raja presumably referred to the overall emperor or king or whatever of the, of the entire region. Okay. And I've get, I have some more readings again here. You, these are all in my... Uh, all in my paper, you can go over those and uh, see what they mean. But, uh, and by the way, not all of these are fully deciphered. I am not claiming here to have fully deciphered the Indus script. What I am claiming to have done is partially deciphered the script to the tune of about 60 characters. Most of them common, a few of them less common. There are a large number of common characters that I haven't been able to figure out that my cross-checking method simply fell short. There wasn't the right uh, amount of, of data. I couldn't draw any conclusions. Um, so there's an enormous amount of work left to be done, okay? Um, what I am claiming, well, we'll go through the summary and we'll see what I'm claiming. So summarizing what we've been able to learn from the massive, brief, repetitive, and mostly notational inscriptions that constitute the Indus corpus, we found a large number of names and titles, including a few king names. So we've mentioned Somhabu, Somin, I didn't mention this one, but Sharman is in there as well, which nowadays is mainly the, like the, a, a, an element affixed to the end of a name. And probably Ratisena, as well as a large number of common names, Para, Ravi, Ravi Prabhu, and many others. Okay, Caste-related names and epithets, Varman, Sharman, Vipra, and Bahuja, uh, for example, and royal titles, Raja, Ati, or Adi Raja, also Ati Raja Raja, as well as Raja Raja. Uh, Pati, Patni, Deva, Devati Deva, Shri or Suri, Shri Deva is in there, Atma Rakshaka, Dhanapala, Bhupala, Bhupati, Bhudeva, and on and on. So there are a lot of those. These and many other names, titles, etc., that all emerge from the values obtained from the, for the signs discussed in this work, together with the other evidences detailed at the beginning of the study, constitute evidence, in my opinion, far beyond any reasonable doubt that the chief language underlying the Indus inscriptions is an early form of Sanskrit. Indo-Aryan, or even Indo-Iranian, if you if you want, and that the inscriptions themselves are largely resolvable into two types, namely appellative inscriptions that simply name the bearer uh, of the seal or whomever it represents. Those are the complex inscriptions, and notational inscriptions, which, um, while often containing names or titles in the P and or C fields, um, you know, have have the primary purpose of the notation of property and assets, either as transactions. Uh, you know, depository transactions or re records of, uh, of donations. Um, so these are the patterned inscriptions. But all of the uses of patterned inscriptions are still far from clear, but the purport of many of the inscriptions strongly suggests a relationship with temple donations or do deposits. That some inscriptions may in fact be donative inscriptions is reinforced by notations with another sign that I've not had time to talk about. That's the little U sign, which whose reading is charu or charu. And the reason I came up with that is that it's also found very sparingly <clears throat> in P fields and um, and uh, uh, complex inscriptions. And the only value that works for it is charu, which means deer. For example, charu deva crops up several times. And that's a, that's a, a pretty well attested name in, in, in very ancient sources. Okay. But charu with a short a happens to be this very important offering, a rice or grain offering, or it, it refers to the pot in which it is prepared. So my hypothesis is that's what this sign represents. And when you see that sign with stroke, it's actually recording. It's actually a record of a sacrifice that was made for donative purposes. Okay, in Indus, Indus society, so here's some a few data we can draw about the society from this. Like historical India was characterized by caste and presided over by various princes and monarchs. The very old and worn seal bearing the inscription Atiraja Somabhu, Supreme King Somabhu, is particularly suggestive inasmuch as Somabhu was the name of the legendary founder of the lunar dynasty, the supposed offspring of the moon 
the Soma, and regent of Buddha or Mercury. It is also perhaps significant that the lunar dynasty has always been associated with, with the Kshatriya uh, caste and the term Bahuja, uh, Kshatriya, is extremely prominent in the Indus inscriptions. None of which I knew, by the way, before I deciphered them. Th these are things that I found out after the fact that seem to, to support these readings. None of this is to say that in the Indus inscription, what, this Indus civilization was the lunar dynasty, but that it seems possible that some of the elements of the lunar dynasty mythology may have been inspired by features of this civilization. Okay. Now, for those of you who are interested in pursuing this further, the work of decipherment is far, far, far from complete. It includes a number of tasks that, given this current state of evidence, may be unattainable unless many more inscriptions come to light. For example, a number of common signs, like the signs given there, appear to be undecipherable given the available evidence. And the same may be said for dozens of infrequently occurring signs. On the other hand, there are a number of remaining common and distinctive signs whose meaning may yield to future iterations of decipherment. And I list a few of those here. So also needing clarification <coughs> are those juncture signs, which I mentioned, what function they actually have. There's, there's, there are various types of quadripartite circumgraphs, like little, four little dots that enclose other signs. And uh, we don't know what those mean either. Um, so th th these are just a few of, of, of possible things that can be done. Additionally, while we have furnished likely readings for several ligatured signs, it seems very likely that many more Indus signs are in fact compounds or ligatures, and the rules for compound formation are far from clear. In some cases, ligatures seem to represent simple conflations of two signs that may be optionally written as two discrete graphemes whose readings are simply the combined full values of the signs. This is the case with compounds like those uh, that, like uh, that, those given, okay? Shripati. Okay. Other compounds seem to incorporate sound elements of constituent signs, but their readings are greater than the sum of their parts. As we've seen, if you notice when I went through the list, we have that sign that looks like the two interlocking circles with the three bars or three ticks in it, and uh, which seems to be a co compound of the three bar, bar sign and that because it the meaning of that is rashtra, which is another important word. Everyone in India knows what the word rashtra means, right? Uh, it's and um, it's found in the reading in rashtrapala among other things. But what we actually have is ra plus, plus tra, okay? So ra and tra are there, so they're suggestive of the, 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 the phonological contours of the entire word, but they don't show every detail, just the ra and the tra, not the shta part in the middle, okay? Uh, let's see, so, so, still some other signs seem to have broad overlap with non-compounded related signs, such as the aforementioned Bowman sign versus the bow sign and, and certain others as well. And it's not clear what the function of that, that, that human, that little, you know, anthropomorph stick man figure is. So there's an enormous amount of work to be done. And uh, let's see, that's the end, but I, did, I wanted to go back to the beginning. I wonder if there's a way to do that easily, just to show you the first sign. Um, yeah, okay. Let's go back to the beginning, just for a moment. So this is probably the most famous artifact in the Indus, in the, uh, from the Indus Valley, as I mentioned at the beginning, the Pashupati seal. And believe it or not, we can now read what the inscription says at the top. Now, first of all, some people think that that little dude stick figure up in the upper left-hand corner is actually part of the writing. It is not. First of all, it's much larger than the other signs. Second of all, it does not resemble uh, very closely the stylized stick figure sign. And that stick figure sign never occurs in that sort of position, okay? And there's another stick figure over on the right, just above the tiger rampant that's near where it's broken off. Uh, that sometimes has been interpreted as writing as well. I don't think it is. I think that those two stick figures represent human beings mingled with the beasts. So the Lord depicted on the dais is actually the Lord of men and beasts. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, since this is the seal and not the impression, we're actually reading from left to right. And the first two signs are the one that looks like the, 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 the tongs, and then right next to it is a sign that looks rather similar, but it doesn't have the little hooks on the end. It just kind of sticks out like this. And this was the most shocking of all, and one of the most recent. This occurred to me only about less than a year ago. It was, it, it was actually my final decipherment. And it occurred because, thanks to the ICIT, I was able to ascertain the value of that second sign, which has a lot more data. And it turns out that that second sign, its value is kara, K-A-R-A, which means hand in Sanskrit, okay? The first sign, as we've already established, is vasu. And one day I happened to look at this, this inscription, which I long since assumed I would never be able to read, okay? And I looked at it, I thought, vasu kara. And then the rest of it, well, the next sign in the middle, right over his headpiece is that sign for property. So it means property of whatever. And then there's a fish sign. 
uh, and a, a, a little jar sign, which is obviously some sort of not notation of value. Okay, so the first two signs seem to be the, a name, Vasukara. I thought, oh, well, I wonder if there's such a name as Vasukara. Well, I looked at, well, there isn't such a name as Vasukara. There is no attested name Vasukara. But by sheer grotesque luck, I then discovered that there is, however, a name Vasukra, V-A-S-U-K-R-A. Vasukra is the name of no less than two different authors of Vedic hymns. And it's also an attested name of several other people as well. Um, when I saw that, I was, I was just floored because the reading that comes out is property of Vasukra or belongs to Vasukra. And then there's a notation of value, you know, worth whatever that fish is. But again, this is another example of a mythical name, you know, appearing on a seal and also a seal. I mean, you would think, well, if Vasukra was, if there were various rishis named Vasukra and if they had personal seals, you'd expect it to look something like this, you know, with a clear you know, powerful religious iconography. So whoever owned this seal was presumably both important and devout. Um, and well, I now propose that the seal change its name from the Pashupati or Lord of the Beast seal to the great seal of Vasukra, because that is the name on the top. All right, I'm done. Um, let's see, it's been a little over two hours. So for those of you who are left. Um, right. Um, so as long as you want. So thank you, uh, Steve. I, I think we have some time for questions. I hope you can be around for another 20 to 30 minutes. However long. It's the weekend. I'm fine. Okay, great. Um, I still have water in my bottles too, so we're right. okay. So uh, I have a few of my questions, and then we have questions from the audience, and we'll try to address uh, address them. Okay. So the one of the interesting questions, or one of the questions that pop up all the time is the non-script hypothesis. Mm. So uh, you know, some people have claimed that the Indus, uh, the you know, the so-called inscriptions are not actually writing; they're just uh, symbols that you know they denote deities or uh, something else. It's just not writing. So, do you have any um, comment on that? I do. So, th th this hypothesis was originally. Um, propounded a little over 20 years ago by, um, by Farmer, Witzel, and Sprout. Of the three, the only one who is a South Asianist was Witzel, is Witzel, he's still alive, Michael Witzel at Harvard University. And ironically, he's a Sanskritist. Um, the other two, um, you know, you know far Farmer, it's usually associated with Farmer's name. I saw Farmer give a presentation on it many years ago at Harvard. Um, and I wasn't very impressed, and neither were other people who watched it. Um, Farmer, uh, Farmer's contention is well, you know, he, he's you know, they, with the help of Sprout, who I believe is a, a, a computer guy, a statistician, in fact, did exactly the wrong thing to do, which I've talked about throughout this this uh, presentation. They took the inscriptions and just fed them in and said, okay, let's just look at those inscriptions and look at the. Uh, you know, look, look at the distribution patterns, the randomness of distribution of signs and compare them to other attested writing systems. And what they purported to find, and they, they published, and there was, a, there was a big, for those of you uh, who, whose memories go back two decades and more, this was a big thing, you know, it was published in Science Magazine as was a refutation by some, some colleagues of mine in India and elsewhere, um, saying that, well, no, no, these are just, these are just symbols. Um, you know, like uh, traffic symbols or, or mystic symbol or whatever, there's not writing sorry, because the, dis the distributions are not random enough. Okay, well, they're half right. <laughs> As I've shown you, large fields, significant fields, the M fields in particular, truly are not random enough to be writing in the sense that most people think of when they think of writing, by, by which I mean transcriptive writing. Okay. What Farmer, Witzel, and Sprout failed to perceive, and what every other decipherer, you know, prior to them, apparently, you know, failed to perceive as well, is that these inscriptions, many of them at any rate, are mixtures of both notational and transcriptive writing. And that is what accounts for the bizarre distributional patterns, which indeed, I mean, there was a time 10, 15 years ago when I despaired of figuring it out either. Because even, it turns out, even when you, um, when you when you when you abstract when you take away the m fields when you just when you only deal with the c fields 
the P fields and the complex inscriptions, which as I said, are probably the transcriptional parts, you still end up with a lot of non-randomness, okay? But that's explainable too, as it turns out, as it finally emerged from the results. It's explainable because most of those inscriptions, not all of them, but a large number of them are names and titles. And what is a feature of names and titles? They tend to reuse the same elements over and over again. For example, if you go to Sri Lanka, you'll find like one in every four persons has a last name that ends in Ratna, the word gem, which is a very common thing. Um, likewise, Deva is a very common name and, uh, and name ending element. Uh, in other words, names in India and in many other cultures, in fact, are not just random aggregations of sounds or, or words. Certain words are picked, you know, words that are, you know, patronymics and things like this that become more important. And so if you're dealing with a very skewed database to begin with, in this case, a database that has a large number of names and titles, then you're going to see a lot of repeated elements. For example, the element bu, which I talked about, earth, okay, which is an element <clears throat> in a whole bunch of different variants on the word for king or monarch, bupala, budana, um, and, and so forth, bumhan, there's several others. So, um, so, so this is characteristic of these, and that is, that is one of the reasons for that. Um, the other thing I would say is, frankly, the research system was not well done. Um, I have a hard time, to be honest, maybe, it's, maybe I'm being unjustly egotistical here, but to do something like this, you have to be willing to pay the price. And um, it, the price is paid in terms, you know, years and years of research and work. You have to do the hard work. Uh, whereas Farmer, to be perfectly honest, uh, by his own admission, pretty much worked on it for a relatively compressed period of time. And voila, he had the answer. And, right. I've, you know, and, and they've, they've seen, you see the same thing, you know, mutatis, mutatis. For example, every, every few years, someone comes out, at recent, like three years ago, that claimed that they deciphered the Voynich manuscript. And I read the account. And it was a person who said, it took me two weeks. I started, I just decided to do it, and I did it. And I thought, no, that doesn't work that way, you know. Right. Now, I, uh, I also read the paper and their main arguments. One was that um, there were not enough repetitions, mm -hmm. right? And they said, uh, you know, and the, that, that was their opening thing. And the way they... Uh, decided the repetitions are important for a script is through a survey of I know, some 12 people, probably their colleagues. So to me, this seemed like an argument by popularity. Uh, and secondly, there are actually plenty of repetitions. Uh, in my paper, I have uh, actually counted the repetitions. About 17% of inscriptions have repetitions, yes. which, is, which is a very large number for a logographic, if you consider it logographic or logosyllabic, it's very large. Uh, so the, uh, you know, so that, so the, their counting itself is incorrect. And secondly, right after they say no repetitions, they show signs which have repetitions. Hmm. And uh, they claim that, you know, all the rep repeated sign uh, inscription, all the repetitions are close to each other as if that somehow disqualifies it. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, uh, what to say, logical fallacies in there, which probably requires a um, separate paper to um, illustrate that kind of thinking. And um, I could not find any, um, uh, you know, there's no mathematical model that says, you know, this cannot be, it's just, you know, I, I don't think it's a script because there's no repetition. That's essentially one of their arguments. Yeah. The other well, argument, I, I mean, I, I can say that, I mean, I, I don't think that their idea has a, 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 as much currency now. It, it did attract a lot of attention back in the day, uh, I think particularly from a lot of people who maybe had a, a vested interest in the script not being deciphered. Well, what, what do I mean by that? Well, um, as long as a script remains undeciphered, then the people who do the dirt archaeology and other things like that, the anthropology and all that, they have the final say, okay? And uh, this was, and this has happened before. It happened with the decipherment of, of Mayan, where uh, you know Thompson, who was the chief, uh, who was sort of the doyen of the Mayan, of Mayan, all things Mayan for decades and decades. 
And he rejected out of hand uh, the work of a, of a relatively obscure Russian in the early 50s who said, well, you know, actually, and he pointed out a lot of interesting coincidences, sort of like we've done here, although very, I mean, it was different, but the same kind of, same general idea um, that turned out to be correct, of course. And the response of Thompson was to, to completely, oh, well, he's just a Russian communist. What does he know? Blah, 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 blah. And uh, all this sort of thing. And it wasn't until he passed away that, that the field was freed up. And, and, and other people who'd been working for years and years, kind of on the fringes, had been excommunicated, you know, sort of by, by the establishment, had been prevented from being published. Over. People, you know, the, the dam burst. And in fact, then the Mayan decipherment occurred rather quickly because, you know, but, 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 the, but the thing is, once it was deciphered, this adds a whole new dimension that to some extent will, you know, supersedes or maybe I would like to say complements but it's very different from what can be gleaned by looking at midden heaps and examining, you know, bones and all this type of thing, which is all very legitimate. But deciphering the language gives this vast new trove of, of knowledge. And, and I think, you know, um, yeah, it, it, so, so, so there are politics involved in this too, sometimes. Right. I think this is one of the, this is probably the most controversial subject in uh linguistics or whatever, because I, I think any anything else, no one would uh, um, see this kind of contention and arguments and, and so on. So uh, moving to the next question, it, it, did, did you uh, have a chance to look at the, um, the Semitic seals with Indus inscriptions that are claimed to be written in a different language? Did you um, try to read them and they were not Indo-Aryan, or did you look at uh, the mixed Brahmi Indus inscriptions and were you able to read them? Um, no, no, um, I, I don't have, I don't know anything about Semitic languages. Um, I mean, my, my, my Middle Eastern expertise, I mean, I, I do, I do know Avestan, but only because in the context of, you know, the Indo-Iranian, and I did study <coughs> cuneiform uh, Hittite many, many moons ago as an undergraduate, but I don't really know anything about Semitic languages. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the, of, of, you know, the West Asian inscriptions and they, and some of them certainly do appear to, to represent, you know, like there's one that has the, the jar sign, uh, you know, geminate jar sign and this sort of thing, which that does suggest that, that, you know, there's some data there from other languages, but I wouldn't know how to go about it. And I would point out, of course, that they're not necessarily Semitic. I mean, there's also the non-Semitic Sumerian language in that, in that region that, that might be brought to bear. But I, you know, there, there are so few of those West Asian seals and the inscriptions are so brief it might be really difficult to, to make much of that. But you know, right. I, don't know. I would also add, you know, one should be careful of artifacts that are not recorded in, well, I, I mean, artifacts that are not recorded by, you know, you know the, 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 who have very clear provenience because there's an enormous amount of fakery involved with, the, with, with Indus artifacts. It turns out if you have a, you know, a, a workshop, a basement workshop in Afghanistan, you can churn out plausible looking Indus artifacts. You know, you can, you can sell anyone, even little, little, little ones, you know, pot sherds and so forth for 20 bucks a piece. And if you come up with a plausible seal or something like that, you know, you can get hundreds or thousands of dollars for it. So there, there, the world has been flooded with a lot of fake stuff. So I, I combine my research to things that I know, uh, you know, are, you know, come from excavation sites so, for example, the, 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 the photographic corpus that was prepared by Parpola et al. is now in four volumes, I guess, is reliable. The ICIT comes from those sources and from, you know, you know from Vats and Mackay, from the early you know, the excavation reports, uh, Mahadevan concordance likewise. So these are reliable sources. One should be careful about other stuff because there, there, there are a lot of, a lot of, I mean, if you, if you, if you do a search, you know, or look on eBay, you know, you'll see what I'm talking about. Right, I don't mean eBay or anything. These are from uh, archaeological digs, and the the Brahmi Indus mixed inscriptions are also from archaeological digs in Tamil Nadu. I I, I was hoping you have perhaps if you have a chance you could look at them in the future. I'll look at them. I right, I'm just aware of them. So uh, another point that's raised by a lot of people is the the fact that there are many signs that occur only once. So the so-called uh, singletons. Mm. And does that somehow uh, invalidate the idea that the Indus inscriptions are a script? No, not at all. Because uh, again, as, as, as I've shown in, in, in the presentation, 
there are a number of signs that have full logographic value or like these CVCV signs can basically stand as a word unto themselves. Um, also, uh, there's the fact that, you know, these inscriptions are highly compressed. They don't seek to, to represent every aspect of the word is spoken. <coughs> so, um, for, for example, as I said, I, I, I'm skeptical that there are any actual case ending signs as such. There, you know, I mean, the, the juncture signs kind of look like it, but I think there, there, there may be there, there may something else that they're doing there. And this is borne out by other proto-scripts, proto-cuneiform, proto-Mayan, uh, proto-Egyptian hieroglyph, <coughs> all of which in their earliest stages are found in, not to mention, well, and of course, uh, proto-Elamite, um, proto although that's not really been deciphered. But all of these, these, these earliest stages of scripts are found in highly compressed style in, you know, ca tablets of accountancy, in tags, that are attached to things that you know were, were, were traded and this sort of thing, um, and typically did not seek to you know to represent language as actually like what we say full fledged literature. That came later, and only in some some of those cultures, um, as far as we can tell. So proto Elamite never seems to have developed into a full Elamitic script. Instead, the Elamites at a certain point adopted a version of cuneiform to use as their own. As a literary language, so um, so it's so so it, it, yeah, in, in no way invalidates it. And uh, um, in fact, I would predict, particularly if if it turns out, if if someday we find some miraculously preserved troves of, let's say, birch bark manuscripts or palm frond manuscripts, I don't know how, what that would look like. Let's just say we do, we would probably find many more signs <clears throat> than we have right now. And it may turn out that the sign is much more logographic than logosyllabic. Um, in other words, it might have end up having a couple thousand signs or more, uh, but that many of those simply don't occur in the contexts that we see. Right. So the, the some of your some of the signs in Indus are identical to Brahmi signs, and do you have you know do you have identical values for those, or you have derived completely different values? No, I don't. Um, I, I don't think that personally, you know, my, my personal opinion is that that um, that that you know, the Brahmi seems to be an entirely different writing system. Uh, it's not at all uncommon for different writing systems to have values that look similar. Um, and sometimes because there because, you know, there's a limited number of of shapes, particularly basic shapes that are likely to be exploited. Also, I, I do think that the the evidence that Brahmi was was derived from some form of Aramaic um, during the time of Ashoka or shortly before then is, is, is pretty strong, although not entirely strong, but, you know, I mean, if, if Brahmi has greater antiquity or if there's a, you know, a continuity between the Harappan script, the Indus script and Brahmi, you know, then why are there no writings on the punch mark coins, you know, the so-called Puranas, the, the ancient coins, um, which are, you know, are, are much earlier <clears throat> than the Ashokan pillar inscriptions, you know, many centuries earlier. I mean, the, the evidence does suggest, now it doesn't mean that this is the case. I mean, one has to be careful with this because there's an awful lot we don't know. And, and maybe I, I don't know what I'm talking about here, but it does seem to me pretty um, persuasive that there was a, a period of time following the collapse of the Indus civilization and leading up to some time in the first millennia, B, millennia in BCE when India was, was not a literate society. Uh, which would not be surprising because, you know, following the Bronze Age collapse, Greece also, you know, ancient Greece, there was a discontinuity between the literary period, of the, you know, the, the uh, Mycenaean Greek period, which was literary, and then the appearance once again of, 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 of alphabetic Greece, gr Greek, many, many centuries later. Um, but, uh, you know, but, but, but it's interesting that, that both, you know, Homeric Greek, Greek and, uh, you know, and the epic Sanskrit period both featured you know, massive epic poems that were essentially, as far as we know, uh, composed, you know, and, 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 and transmitted entirely orally and were only written down many centuries after the fact. So that's seems to me to be likely. I, it's hard for me to see any continuity between the two scripts, but I, I could be wrong. Right. No, the, recently I found uh, uh, Brahmi inscriptions in Tamil Nadu in uh, you know dated to around 600 BCE and uh, so on so let's let's move on to the next question uh, what is the longest inscription that you have deciphered fully without like leaving gaps oh good question 
I can't say off the top of my head, but uh, probably the longest, the longest that's deciphered fully. Is it the Pashupati seal? No, no, that's the short inscription. Okay. Um, no, probably the. Uh, I mean, I mean, and again, it depends what you mean by deciphered, because the M fields, I don't know what the exact readings are. I mean, the the reading for that fish sign. The fish graphing by itself, when it occurs outside of M field, is mean or mina, which it occurs particularly at the end of, of the word swamin, which crops up quite a bit. Um, but I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, I proposed early on that maybe that maybe it represented the mina, uh, the international mon you know unit of the, the Bronze Age period, which we called the mina. It lasted even after then, which happens to mean fish in South Asian, as everyone knows. Um, so. Um, but I don't know if that's actually what it means. And, and the other, you know, some of those others, uh, the only one I have a handle on is the Pala sign. I'm, I'm pretty confident that that's the value for the staff sign. But the others, I'm just, I'm basically saying in general, this is what it meant, but I don't know what the, what the amounts were. So, so with, that, with that caveat, um, you know, I mean, I've deciphered some inscriptions that are maybe eight, nine, 10 characters long. Um, for example, you know, um, I don't know, let's see, um, Atma Rakshaka. The, the one that means uh, protector. Well, that's actually only four characters. So I don't know how you, how you would explain that. Uh, but some of the longer ones. But yeah, I mean, I mean, and this is the thing. I mean, decipherment as a whole is, is an iterative process. Um, when, when Ventris deciphered Linear B, you know, one of the first admissions he made was, well, okay, um, many of the inscriptions remain as mysterious now as, as they were the first time I or Arthur Evans looked at them. But... There are a number now that do make sense, that we do have readings for whole or partial. And that's where I'd say we are at this point. So, um, but it would be presumptuous of me to say, I have deciphered the script. Uh, no, I've partially deciphered the script, enough to draw certain conclusions, but there's, you know, there's an awful lot left to be done. And the, the longer the inscription, the more likely there will be, you know, a sign or two in there that say, oh, I don't know what that one means. Um, one of the longest inscriptions is like a three line inscription is almost entirely an M field. So, I mean, that, that's not a, not, not particularly exciting. And there's another long inscription that's sort of mixture. It's, it's basically a pattern inscription in multi lines where I can read a number of the elements in it. Um, probably, I, I guess probably the longest one would be the one that, that the, the example that I gave of a compound inscription where it starts with a little metrology notation and then it has, it has, it, it has the compound Arya Raja Bhupala Bahoja, and then has the you know belongs to thing at the end. Um, so, right. so yeah. I'm just going to take some questions from the oh yeah here's audience. Um, yeah, you can answer this question. Have the meanings yeah. of the signs changed over time? Okay, this is a really good question, uh, Dasana, and this and and so. Part of it is a, is, is a long-standing problem that, that modern archaeologists will point out, which is that the original, you know, Vats Mackay and the people who did the original excavations at Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro a century ago did not do a good job seriating a lot of their finds. Okay, in other words, saying, well, this, th this seal came from this stratum, this came from this stratum, and, you know, at least establishing some sort of relative uh, dating of them, okay? And, uh, but here's the funny thing about the Harappan script. Uh, yeah, they do date from at least a millennia, possibly more. And yet, there doesn't seem to really be any dis discernible change in the script or the inscriptions. There's also very little regional variation. Uh, there are certain types of inscriptions that occur more commonly in Harappan. For example, the little sign that looks like a, like a comb, which I really don't have a reading for. I have a general idea of what it means, but not a reading for. So we didn't mention it here. It's one of the commoner signs. Um, looks like a little comb. It's often found in, in the last position inscriptions. Overwhelmingly, the inscriptions with the comb come from Harappa and come from particular types of artifacts. So there's some variation, but overall, aside from the aforementioned West Asian artifacts, and even some of them clearly are of, of, of Indus provenience, you know, even though they're found in, in West Asia, but, 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 but aside from those, um, you know, there's a remarkable uniformity across both space and time as to the signs themselves. Now there are scribal differences. So there are definitely allographs. Now, whether these allographic variations occurred over, uh, over time, no one has been able to ascertain. Like I mentioned, the, the so-called staff sign 
has two variants. One, it kind of looks like a little a staff with a little U thingy at the top. And the other one, it kind of comes up and it goes off to one side a little bit. It looks more like an actual staff of grain. Um, and whether those two occurrences can, those two, you know, subtypes, those two allographs, as they're called, are actually different in time depth. I, I don't know if, if that could be established at this point because the excavation has been done. I certainly look forward, I mean, on, ongoing excavation of Rakigarhi and I believe Dolavira may yet produce more artifacts and maybe someday Gangwerdiwala, which is an inaccessible site deep in the Tar Desert in Pakistan, in a sensitive area near the Indo-Pakistani Indo border, if that place is ever excavated, you know, maybe we'll get another really big trove and that will be a chance to put my readings to further test. I believe um, even Mohenjo-daro is only like 20 or 30 percent excavated, actually. That's my understanding. One of the problems is, though, is that the methods of modern archaeology have become so exacting that it takes a very long time to excavate even like one cubic meter of dirt and go through and catalog everything. Um, so the, the, the rate at which new artifacts come to light <clears throat> may be a lot greater at this right. point. Next question, is the language Rigvedic pre or post? Good question. Um, I would say just from the, uh, well, let me say first of all about the Veda, the Rig Veda in particular, which is generally believed to be the oldest of the Vedas and therefore the oldest of all the Puranic, Puranic literature. And I believe that's correct. Um, the question is how old? And this is one of those fields where you see very, very self-assured people saying, well, we know that the Rig Veda dates from 1200 BCE or 1500 or 800 or something. They just know this. And um, here's the problem. Up until, you know, sometime in this era, I don't know exactly when the first, the first time it was written down, but we don't have any carbon dated ancient specimens of the Rig Veda. Okay. And also we don't know how fast languages evolve. These are all assumptions. And a lot of the date, the so-called dating of the Rig Veda is based on this now discredited idea of the Indo-Aryan invasion, invasion hypothesis. This is the whole reason we haven't talked much about this, but the whole reason that people are so bent on forcing this to, to be a Dravidian or what I call now the anything, it, it, whatever it is, it can't be a Sanskrit hypothesis. Um, is because you know people uh, have just have this idea that the that the the the, the Indo-Aryans and therefore you know the writers of the of the Rig Veda arrived in South Asia sometime in the middle of the second millennium BCE. Okay, and uh, and 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 this 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 idea has persisted since at least the time of Haras, Henry Haras, back in the 1930s. Even though the Indo, you know, the the invasion itself, there's, you know, has been discredited. So now we have the language X hypothesis. The point of all this, 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 this little rabbit trail is to show that we really have little idea how old the Rig Veda actually is. Okay, um, I think it's fair to say it's not ten thousand years old. Okay, or probably not even five thousand years old, but. To even nail it down to within a millennium is a difficult task because A, it's a heretic text and religious writings tend to be by nature very conservative. I mean, even in English, a lot of people refer to use the King James Bible uh, as their preferred source of scripture, right? And obviously in India, Sanskrit is still a living language in the sense that many Brahmins master it. It's still used uh, even though it ceased to be a spoken language thousands of years ago, okay? And words like pati still exist unchanged in modern Indian languages after thousands of years. So it's very hard to predict the rate at which languages, despite what some linguists will say, languages evolve at very different rates. In the Indo-European family, Lithuanian is extraordinarily conservative and preserves much of the case structure of early Indo-European. English, which is also Indo-European um, and therefore distantly related to Lithuanian as well as Sanskrit, um, is very, very the opposite of whatever the opposite of conservative is in this context, because English has dropped all of the case endings. Even German still preserves those, German and Dutch. We've dropped them all. You know, there's very little aside from the lexicon to e even suggest that English is, in fact, an Indo-European language. We only know about this because of historical records of earlier phases of English. So English has evolved very rapidly, and Lithuanian has evolved relatively slowly, is much more conservative. These are facts 
that historical linguists are sometimes uncomfortable with because obviously, you know, how do you measure something like the rate of evolution of language? It's kind of hard to do. As far as I know, no one's really thought of a way to do that. Okay. So that's a long answer to a short question. I would tend to assume that it's somewhat antecedent to, Rig, to the Rig Veda. It's pre-Rig Veda, but probably not by very much. And it's not entirely out of the question that the Vedas themselves come from this culture, in my opinion, which is absolute heresy to the, you know, to most Western archaeologists at this point. I would point out, however, again, this 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 study that occurred just a few months ago, the results came out in June in Science Magazine and attracted a lot of attention, pushing back not only the time of the Indo-European dispersal, but the time of the movement of the Indo-Aryans into the general area of the subcontinent by thousands of years. Okay, so, yeah. Right, that's the Hegarty paper. And uh, yes. my, yeah, my uh, readings in, in my decipherment, uh, it, the language does look post rigvedic because uh, the, the noun, I'm sorry, the verb conjugations that are specific to uh, Rigveda, such as the uh, late Lakara and so on, do not exist in any of the inscriptions. The separated particles do not exist. There are a few things that are characteristically Rigvedic. They, they don't seem to exist. The verb age, you know, the terms, a lot of them are uh, from the uh, Puranas and Itihasa. So, so my opinion is that it's post-Rigvedic. So let's go to the... But it, I'm just saying, it, it could be because we don't know how old the Rig Veda is. We right. really don't. So we have addressed this, but I just want to uh, add a little bit of thing here. So Farmer's hypothesis is that the symbols represent deities. And essentially, he's claiming that there are more than a thousand deities in, uh, you know, which 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 not not a lot of um, civilizations are going to be able to manage. And but you know, so it it doesn't actually. Uh, it, this is not a. Uh, this is not something that uh, you know anyone can answer uh, without uh, you know breaking into laughter. Essentially. Uh, yes, I I don't know that there's much more to say about this except that it's it, it's errant nonsense. Um, and, uh, yeah, the Indus script is a script. The question is, again, it, was it in other contexts, a full fledged literary script? As I say, you know, there are people that say, well, you know, there, because of the, like the Dolavira signboard, which is a, 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 a novel context for writing, therefore it must've been used in other contexts. And presumably they used birch bark or palm, palm leaf, palm fronds or other perishables to write on rather than writing on stone or in fired clay tablets. So we don't have any record of that. And that's possible. But even if that's not the case, even if this was a writing system that was um, purely utilitarian for, you know, for, for writing names and, 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 and recording transactions on seals and, 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 and uh, you know, pots and things like this, um, that still doesn't mean it's not a script. It just mean that it, it just means that uh, that that it, that in this particular culture they did not see perceive a need, you know, perhaps because it was a culture where texts like the Vedas were were created and circulated and maintained orally by a special anointed hieratic class, and there was no need for for a scribal writing system as such. Possibly, right? So uh, many either way, it's a script. End right. of script. Right. So many, uh, many of the pottery um, inscriptions are post-firing, and mm -hmm. they're found all over. So that essentially is taken as a sign of a literate society. Yes. Also, the uh, inscriptions on personal items such as swords, bangles, and so on, uh, and the the Dolavera signboard, which is essentially at the north gate of the town, is designed to be seen from a large distance. So it wouldn't make sense. For any of these things to happen, if the uh, if if it's a non-script, yeah, and I mean, I mean, it's hard to imagine a huge extended civilization like this not having a writing system, you know, for for right. for communicating across time and space. You know, I mean, uh, people will say, well, the counterexample, how about the Aztecs? Well, first of all, the Aztec civilization was not very long lasting, and second of all, they did have a pro proto writing system, although it wasn't as sophisticated as the Mayans. Oh, what about the Incas in South America? All they had were those knots, those quipus. Well, that's interesting because it turns out that in the Quechua language, which was the language of the Incas, there is a word for writing 
And it isn't a borrowed word from Spanish. I know this because a colleague of mine at Cornell was a Quechua instructor, and he told me this. We talked about this one day, and he said, yeah. He said, so we don't have any extant specimens of Quechua writing, but we, we suspect there must have been a written language at some phase because there's a word for it, and it's not a borrowed word from somewhere else. And then, you know, the, the BMAC, the more or less contemporaneous civilization uh, north of the, the Harappans, we haven't had really found any evidence that they had writing that didn't, did, doesn't mean it didn't exist. I think we forget just how destructive the force of nature is over the course of centuries and millennia, particularly with the changing climate in South Asia uh, over the last several thousand years. Um, who knows what has been lost? Right, right. So you mentioned that the writings could be something to do with temples. And uh, this question is, they haven't found any temples. Yep. No, and that's a good point. And, and yeah, and so yes. There must have been temples or of some sort. Maybe they they weren't maybe a, a large, elaborate temples with gopurams or whatever, like you have in uh, in South India or even or even North India or anything like that. Um, there are several sites that have been proposed as possible temple sites. Um, the Great Bath, for example, um, it's not clear whether that may have been some sort of a sacred uh, a place for sacred ablutions or whether it was just a swimming pool or whether it was just uh, the you know the local reservoir, the tank. Uh, as they call them in South Asia nowadays. Um, it's not clear. But yeah, I mean, no no temples in the sense of no standing buildings other than, of course, the much later Buddhist stupa atop the hill in Mahenjo-daro. Um, you know, so it's not clear. But on the other hand, uh, if some of the more interesting seals, and we haven't really shown a lot of pictures of the seal, but some of the more interesting seals do clearly show not only um, clearly religious motifs, not just our, our friend, uh, the... Uh, you know the Vasukra, the seat, the seated uh, horn headpiece guy, but there there are others that clearly show you know mythological scenes and things like this, um, and uh, scenes of scenes of of offerings being made and things of this sort. So there's no question that that that, that there was that there was a religion, and there being it being an urbanized civilization, it seems almost inconceivable that there weren't actual physical places, whether they were temples or what they called. Uh, you know, Devadana, which is like the larger holy ground uh, consecrated to a temple, whether these took the forms of more open rural grove-like temples that you find in rural India, or whether there were, in fact, some more large urban type uh, temples that were just knocked down and are not are no longer recognizable as such is not clear. Right. I do think it's curious that we haven't found um, really any, any statuary, any religious statues. Uh, the priest-king bust, which I should, which the very last image at the end of my show, maybe a counterexample, but otherwise it seems odd that in, in the Bronze Age, a world thick with gods and goddesses of every type and description and across civilizations, that they don't seem to have had any such thing. So, Next question about uh, wordplace puns, rhymes. Oh, hi, Jeff. Um, no, I would say only only um, there, there are some... Um, obviously some rebus values associated with some of the signs, as, as we indicated earlier, which ended up helping us establish, you know, some of these an anchor values. But as far as anything else, I mean, um, I haven't deciphered enough of it and quite possibly the material involved is not lengthy enough to incorporate those sorts of things. Would that there were, I mean, I mean, every decipher and every archeologist and every historian hopes that that a new writing system is going to have is going to be rich in cultural and religious detail and have lots of you know evidence of of, of, of literary sophistication, including word plays, plays puns, uh, uh, you know th th things of this nature. Um, obviously, uh, you know um, such as are found, for example, in the writings of of, of the ancient ancient Hebrews and so forth, uh, chiasmus as it's called, um, and or chiasmus. But we just, you know, absent some new significant trove of evidence, I, I don't know that we're likely to find things like that. I'm certainly unaware of any. Right. Okay, so this question, I, I will take the first part and then uh, Steve can take the second part. Uh, so the, I think the primary difference is that my um, decipherment has, you know, each sign has a particular phoneme and it's, has a default vowel of a, uh, just like uh, a bugida, and it can be overridden by uh, a vowel sign. Uh, in terms of the signs, ma, you know, um, I, I have deciphered all, I believe I've deciphered all the signs, including conjuncts. 
Um, in terms of the methodology, mine is a cryptographic uh, you know, methodology. I do believe that in principle, uh, Steve has used a similar concept in that you can take, if you, if you find a few, if you identify a few signs with certainty or with, with some kind of confidence, then you can look into the text and try to find the other signs. So I have no, uh, so essentially the granularity, if, if, if Steve changes his granularity to smaller or if I change the granularity to larger, there would be a lot of overlap in the results. This is what I think. Steve, if you have any comments. I agree. I mean, I think that um, obviously, you know, we, we've arrived at somewhat different, I think significantly different results, but we both arrived at the same conclusion and, and I think it's fair to say we're not being driven by political. I mean, one of the th things you hear when people say, oh, it's Indo-Aryan. Oh, you must be one of those uh, BJP fanatics or something. You must be a Hindu nationalist and uh, th this type of thing. And, and you know, we're, that, that doesn't have any bearing on this. OK, the only I think it's fair to say we're both interested in, in establishing the truth of the matter. And it's, I think, very interesting that we both arrived at the conclusion that it has to be some form of Indo-Aryan. But that's what the evidence uh, seems seems to suggest, um, you know, and, and ultimately, I mean, it, it, I think it's wonderful that that we can have this discussion without vitriol, without insult. I mean, obviously, we don't agree on all, on every point, but the the goal here is to find out the truth of it. That, that that's that's what it is, and and unfortunately, so often, um, and this is particularly endemic in 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 Indus studies, you know, the ego stuff enters into it, and 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 it just I don't know. It, it, it's it's it, it's unfortunate because this is a most vexing puzzle, just right. owing, you know, owing to the the nature of the of the evidence. The the reason I like Dr. Bonta's approach and everything in the you know I've read some of his papers. You should if you guys are interested in uh, the you know the line of uh, research that he pursues. You should read his papers on academia. So I have I have read them, and it was very refreshing for me coming from an engineering background. Uh, that these papers did not have any, you know, ad hominem or any logical policies. It's just dense and full of content. Whereas with many other, uh, you know, people whose names I don't want to take, you know, it starts with uh, ad hominem. This person is an X, this person is a, somehow as if, you know, their uh, views on other topics invalidates the, their research. So uh, it was very refreshing to read uh, Bonta's research. And um, you know, I'm I'm glad I uh, I found him through uh, academia. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. So this is another question. It's about uh, frequency analysis of uh, nouns. Okay. Let's see. So, given that most of this decipherment yields proper names, has Dr. Bontadani <coughs> frequency comparison with a corpus of attested proper names or noun syllables from ancient Sanskrit? I have not, simply because um, I think any any, well, I mean, I use the, these online searchable databases, which are corpora of sorts. But if, if by corpus, I mean, normally what corpus means is, is an, a bunch of, of, of actual texts. So, for example, if I want to make a corpus of, of modern day American English, I might, you know, just create a database that has millions and millions of, of news stories and novels and magazines and all this type of thing, you know, every conceivable report. Um, or I can restrict it. I could do a corpus, you know, of, of certain types. But I, I don't know. The, the, the closest thing to a corpus of this type of material would probably be the Indian epigraphical glossary. Um, but it's not extensive enough. Um, so, uh, you know, if, 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 a, if the corpus included, let's say, all of the Puranic literature um, and did, did frequency counts, obviously they'd be very, very different because the problem is that the context of these writings is so restricted, whereas a corpus, by its very nature, in the sense that 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 corpor that um, corpora uh, corp corp what do they call it uh, corpus linguistics, which is a relatively new branch of linguistics, would contemplate, uh, is is typically much more expansive. It just seeks to create an, an undifferentiated corpus of of materials. So I don't know where any such corpus could be found. If we could find a corpus just of, let's say, donative inscriptions or just a, a, of inscriptions, period. It might be of some utility, but even there, because the, you know, the, the, the context is so, so distinctive, 
I, I don't know that it would it would would yield much in the way of reproducible or falsifiable data. Right. So and I'd like to add something here. So frequencies uh, typically change with the time. So if you look at uh, at the Bible from a thousand years ago, which we do have, the frequencies of letters are different from the Bible of today. And there are some letters that have been dropped. Uh, so the letter for the, you know, some of these um, uh, characters from Norse uh, have been dropped. They don't exist anymore. And new letters have been added. You know, the letter J is actually very, very young. Um, so the so that is one. The other is if these inscriptions are very short and they are very specialized, if they're for ritual purposes or donative purposes or something, they would not have the same uh, frequency as a general text. You know, the, the general text that came later, the Puranas, and uh, they would have definitely have a different uh, frequency. For example, consider a, a garment store which sells jackets, jeans, uh, jumpers, and so on. They would have a lot of J's. But in in actual, you know, real English, J is a much, much more rarer letter. So yeah, that's, that's why, letter. yeah. And that, and as Bonta said, the uh, the, the corpus is so small that it, it may not yield anything useful. Well, I, I mean, again, I think if, if, if the nature of the evidence were different, if we had like the, the sort of thing that, that Champollion and his successors had with regard to, to Egyptian, you know, troves and troves of libraries of papyri with lots of long texts and this sort of thing. Um, if we had something like that, let's say someone unearths a, a Harappan library and there's lots and lots of texts in there, whether in the form of big tablets or scrolls or something, then you might be able to say, if you know, if this, these texts obviously are, you know, historical, and say, okay, let's take a corpus of the Puranas, or for that matter, if you wanted to go that route, a corpus uh, involving, uh, you know, the Tirukural and other uh, early forms of Tamil or something like that, and do comparisons. Um, you know, that would probably have a lot more utility because you'd have more or less similar commensurable, you know, context to work with. Right. So uh, the next question is about the, you know, why are there no deity names? Yeah, that's very odd. I don't know. There, I, 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 I thought about that myself. Agni, Indra, and Varuna, none of those. Uh, and yeah, and you've, I don't know, maybe you've, you've, you've looked at my paper already. Those are not in there. Um, uh, the, some of the deity names, I mean, Vasu is, uh, which is sort of a, an all-purpose you know, term for a, a very important class of deities. Um, and the few, you know, epithets, but they, they may be names of people. So I, I don't know. It, it could well be that those all refer to actual people, you know, uh, rather than to rather than to deities per se. I do, I do not know. Right. Yeah, so no, I, I definitely wondered about, I wondered about that and I continue to wonder. Right. So, uh, you know, Bonta did find, uh, sorry, I, sh I should say Steve or Dr. Bonta, uh, did find... Uh, Soma, so that is one. Yeah, Soma is definitely uh, there, definitely. Right. And that's Vasu, which is uh, also a Vedic deity. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, remember that these are seals that have survived. And over, I don't know, 2,000 years or whatever, you know, they started making seals in 4,000 BC. So over 2,000 years, most of these seals have broken, disappeared, damaged. The, what we have left are the survivors. So it's, you know, there may be others that... Um, uh, that have many other names that we cannot uh, locate. Okay, so the next question is, uh, you know, it could be an IA, but a non-Vedic culture. Well, I mean, it, you know, it could be in the sense that, uh, I mean, as my advisor at uh, at Cornell pointed out years ago, he said, well, technically, you would probably wouldn't want to say Indo-Aryan, but Indo-Iranian, because this might be, if, if this turned out to be you know, it would be the precursor not only of Sanskrit but also of the Indo-Iranian languages. So that, so, so that's, but that you know, again, that's a dating issue, and we're not really sure, you know, when when that when that works out. Another point that, that bears mentioning is this, um, and this is for the people who are just absolutely convinced that it has to be Dravidian or language X or whatever. Just because the inscriptions are in a seem to be the majority of the inscriptions seem to be in a form of Indo-Aryan or Indo-Aryan, what do you want to call it, Proto-Sanskrit, Vedic Sanskrit, doesn't necessarily mean that that was the only language or that that was the lingua franca of the people. There are, of course, many instances in history, a conspicuous one being um, Middle, Middle, medieval Europe, 
where the linguae franci were practically unknown as literary languages, but Latin was used as the actual language of, you know, records and law and all this type of thing. Um, you also see the example of the Mitanni uh, civilization, uh, which in which the, P, the Mitanni themselves uh, seem to have sp spoken a foreign language. Hurrian was their language, non-Indo-European, everything else. And yet most of their, they had God names and names of people that are all Vedic or all Sanskrit. So where does that come from? You know, and also terms re relating to horses and, you know, equ equestrianism and so forth. So it's, it's not at all uncommon for a language used for record keeping and even for names to not necessarily reflect uh, the lingua franca or perhaps one of several lingua, linguae francae. So this doesn't necessarily say that there were no speakers of Dravidian or for that matter, other language groups uh, residing in this population. Right, and also if it's a, you know, if it's a liturgical or some kind of religious uh, um, purpose for the inscriptions, then it would it would still be in Sanskrit. Even uh, even today, there are many different languages, but the the even the mottos we use on the government, you know, slogans, Satyameva Shamna Varna, all of these are um, Sanskrit. So it is it is. And this is one of the reasons the language may not have changed a lot throughout the life of the inscriptions, because these are, um, you know, it is uh, in a particular context. Right. Uh, yeah. So the next question is maybe it's for me. Um, uh, Suzanne Redia, Redalia, yeah, that's Sue Sullivan. She uh, has a decipherment, I think, in 2014. And this was a important. Um, important decipherment because it was the first time a large body of text was uh, uh, you know, attempted to be uh, tra transliterated and translated. Uh, many of them are kind of, um, uh, you know, unreadable in the sense, you know, the transliteration would be like Kawakka and she would read it as Kawacha and so on. While they do have, while her decipherment does have Va and Cha and so on. So, but, um, this actually led to uh, her work actually led to a lot of people trying to do uh, fix that and do decipherment themselves. And, uh, you know, I was also, I also read that. And the thing I realized with some of her short inscriptions is that, uh, it does make sense, uh, that because I have a little bit of a cryptographic background, what I did realize is that at least some of her signs are right. And the areas where it's going bad is where um, you know you know there are mistakes so what happens in a translation when it's in a transliteration if you have one or two letters that are bad it will force a word break so um, so so I looked at her thing and I realized that yes this is probably a good language to start with so it did help me and there are many people who are doing it right now the, the and you can you know that it's um, it is inspired by her work because you find some of the logo, uh, some of the values are from her work. So, for example, the word Deva for the the, the rake, double rake sign and the Aksha for the circle, that is uh, her uh, uh, values. So you, you find a lot of that today on, on the internet. Uh, so I don't know, uh, Steve, if you're uh, familiar with her work, have you seen her work? I actually am not. Okay. To be honest, but um, but I but but here's the thing. I mean, I applaud anyone who makes an honest effort at this. This is an important work, and um, yeah, I mean, we're yeah. all in this together. So. I, I can send that to you. I can send her work to you, and um, it is very interesting. I think her breakthrough was that she assumed the Brahmi letters, which are common in both, have the same values, which is why she was able to read so much. I, I got to tell you though, I don't think she's the first person to make that assumption. No, it, no, she it wasn't. Sure. Serves, there was there was a guy back in the early '80s who had a a decipherment where he tried. To, I think he 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 equated the Brahmi writing with 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 Indus writing. Um, I think Hunter also claimed that in '34, 1934. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Hunter may have. Yeah, I think yeah. so. So so it's it's not it's not a novel claim. Right. right. No. Okay. Uh, I think this is, this may be the last question. What are your plans for publishing your work? Oh, well, yes, thank you, Dasana. Um, well, I'm trying to publish a, a distillate of it right now. It, 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 it turned out, I don't want to sound 
complainy or whiny, but it's very difficult to publish this sort of thing nowadays because, um, you know, academic presses won't touch it. Um, an earlier monograph that I did, which turned out to have some errors, but also, you know, uh, you can see that one also in my academia.edu account. Um, I remember I approached a particular academic press and the person who received it was very excited, sent it off to, uh, thought it was very interesting and all this sort of thing, sent it off to a reviewer who obviously knew nothing about the subject at all. And the reviewer returned it dismissively and said, oh, don't publish this. It's not a full decipherment. Okay. I'll, you know, showing that he knew nothing about, about the whole thing. And at that point, you know, I've had experience over the years where I'd send this stuff off and I don't even get a reply because people tend to assume, you know, the gatekeepers tend to assume, even though I do have a PhD and obviously a lot of bona fides as a South Asianist, uh, they tend to assume, well, you know, um, he, he's, he's obviously a crackpot because, you know, only crackpots would do this sort of thing. And it, it, it's, it's proven to be uniquely difficult in this field. I, I don't know why, but for the last 30 years, it's been almost impossible for, to get things published. I mean, uh, my colleague, Brian Wells, who I mentioned earlier, has a PhD from Harvard University in archaeology, and he has trouble getting his stuff published because, because of the, the, the gatekeeper issue, because of the idea that, you know, that, I don't know, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. So, so you say, okay, well then try to publish some version of it in, in a journal. So I created a much, I mean, the, the manuscript online, you know, lays it all out. It's, you know, several hundred pages long, very lengthy, 50,000 words. I forget what it is. And that doesn't include all of the, you know, all the tables. Um, so it's very, you know, very, very lengthy, but no one will publish that as a book. Um, and then, you know, distilling that down to a defensible paper of, well, I mean, you know, mo most of the science journals nowadays, the assumption is if you can't say it in 4,000 words, forget it, you know? And so like, for example, science, I think that's, that's the limit, 4,000 words. And there's another one that I looked at, um, that goes up to 6,000 words provisionally. And so I, and I found one where there was no actual word count listed in their for the offers thing. So I sent it off to them and was immediately informed. Nope, it's too long. You know, and then I got, I got it down to about 10,000 words. It says too long, too complicated. We don't like the formatting. You know, they didn't, they didn't pay attention to what was in it. They just dismissed it because it didn't meet their formatting, which is their right. I mean, you know, so it's basically unpublishable as far as I can tell, um, in, in peer review journals. I now have it under review at another journal that maybe will, will give it a look. Um, yeah, but the thing is, you know, my response to the aforementioned science journal was to, was to withdraw it. I said, you know, I, I can't cut another 10 pages out of it. It won't make any, it'll just be, it'll make me a laughing stock. You know, you have to, if you make an extraordinary claim, you have to provide extraordinary evidence. And that means a lot of data. And so, you know, so there's really the only, the only option is at this point that I see is, is, is online. So I finally decided after a long time, I thought this is, you know, too important to keep to myself. Um, I mean, I, I had this done by early 2021, but I sat on it for another year and a half before I finally threw it online. And then my brother also put it on his, on his, on his X account, his Twitter account, which has attracted like a, close to a hundred thousand views, um, spread rather rapidly through the, uh, the internet sphere. Um, but I really don't know what else to do, uh, because I don't have, I'm not connected. I'm not part, not, not an insider, um, I live, right. in the, I live in the state of Wisconsin, but I have no actual connection to the University of Wisconsin, Madison, where there, there's some work uh, being done on the Indus Valley. Um, it's just, it's just, and, and, and I'm not very good at being a self promoter either. And I certainly, you know, so I'm not afraid to be wrong. Um, that's the whole, the whole point of, of this exercise. Um, but, you know, that's my answer. I, I guess, and, and unless I can get this, this aforementioned shorter paper published, which if it is, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll put that on academia.edu as well. Um, then I'm, I'm pretty much at a dead end. I don't think that, 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 that any of the establishment, uh, you know, sources will, 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 would touch it with a 10 foot pole. Right. Uh, so there may be some uh, journals like antiquity journal, which may be more open, um, or you could just publish a book, like you could self-publish a book, um, you know, make it into a PDF, let people, because at this point, you, you know, you are not looking for academic accolades or nope. you, know, you are, you just have this thing and you want people to benefit from it, right? So even if you just create a nicely formatted PDF book, I think people would uh, 
it will get consumed like i said you, like you said 100000 views on that uh, tweet so uh, yeah yeah so there's this uh, final word here which i think um, i think many people would agree with the sentiment um, well thanks tastana i mean i i kind of regard this as i mean i love india and all of south asia i've spent quite a bit of time there um i i'm just fascinated with the culture and um uh, I, I don't have any, you know, political agenda here. You know, I mean, I would have been equally happy had it proven to be. In fact, I started studying Tamil before I started studying Sanskrit. Um, I would be equally happy for it to turn out to be um, Dravidian. Um, I, I just think that it is, it is high time that this orphan civilization, and I say orphan because we, we, we don't, it doesn't have a voice at this point, you know, that it, that it have a voice and uh, that, 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 that the, the full, magnificence of the prehistory of, of India, of, of South Asia, you know, be recognized. So in that sense, you know, I, I regard this as to the extent that it, that, that it's correct as, as, as my, my offering, you know, to, to, to the people of India, whom, whom I love and respect very much, very highly. Um, and uh, we'll see what, uh, what the verdict of history is. It probably will come long after I passed from the scene, but I, I'm okay with that. Thank you, Steve, for uh, putting 30 years into this and giving it away, you know, just openly to everyone. I think everyone is grateful to just even look at this and benefit from your analysis and, uh, uh, the, the, you know, your expression of uh, your knowledge that you have gained. Uh, hopefully, this has been useful to everyone. And um, we will end our stream here and uh, we will uh, maybe have more sessions with uh, Dr. Bonta in the future. I just add one more thing, and that is I'm always open to collaborating. I mean, at this point, I think I've done all I can do as a single lone dude working in a garret all these years. Um, I have some ideas about how this could go forward, but it would be it would require teamwork at some point. Um, and that's been something that has just been notably absent from this field. Um, so I'm okay. available. All right. Thank you.